This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon and welcome to all the kids joining us on the school drive from Three Oaks Elementary. We have got a special treat for you this afternoon and that might include elephants swimming at Chitwa Chitwa Dam. Look how happy they are. And there's not just that elephant or those two elephants, there's actually a whole lot of them all just feeding. My name is Taylor and on camera with me today is Senzo. And we are looking forward to answering all of your questions there. Are you all excited? Let's see if I can hear how excited all of you are. On three, you're all going to have to shout. What are we gonna make them shout, Senzo? Elephants, are you ready? One, two, three. Hopefully your teachers are all deaf now. Now remember, if you do have any questions, well, all you have to do is put your hand up as quick as you can and ask your teachers. So let's see if any of you have got some questions about elephants. Shall we have a little look? Look what's going on. Now, these are two young elephants. These aren't very big at all. They've still got lots and lots of growing to do before they can become big and strong. And I must tell you, these are the real kings of the savannah. No one challenges the big elephant bull. Now, Gabriella, you've asked about how much do elephants eat every single day. These two young elephant bulls, so these are the boys, they won't be eating as much as their mom or perhaps as their dad, but a really, really big elephant has to eat 5% of its body weight every single day. Can you imagine how much food that is? That's a lot. So. For a really big elephant bull, he'd probably be eating about six, between 550 and 600 pounds of leaves, of fruit, of roots, of bark, of grass, if they can find any. So they have to eat all of those things. And they'll use those long trunks to break off any branches or any leaves and even maybe pick the fruit from the tops of the trees. How cool is that? But they're young boys. They may be only about eight years old or so. Ah, these elephants might be the same age as some of you. Now, Caitlin and Tiara, you've asked why are elephants so big? I don't know. I suppose they were just made that way. But they, they are very big, aren't they? They're the biggest land mammal out here well, in the world. Of course, the whales are bigger than the elephants, but they live in the ocean. So we're just talking about the terrestrial animals. So terrestrial means anything that lives on land. And um, they are, they're, they're just massive. They eat so much food. Can you imagine? If you want to be as big and strong as an elephant, you have to eat your vegetables because that's all they eat. They are just eating leaves and grass. So they would be very happy to gobble up some peas and beans and pumpkin and all those wonderful things. But look, there isn't very much for them to eat. You see that, look how dry it is. So it's very, very sad for these elephants and all the other animals out here because it's now just at the end of winter and we don't have any rain during our winter months. We're in spring now though, and we're waiting for the rain to arrive. Maybe in the next month or two, we'll get some rain. But until then, the animals have to travel far and wide to try and find lots of food but they also need to come and drink every single day so they come down to Chitwa Chitwa Dam often. Regan, so they, they, the reason why elephants only eat plants is because that's the way that their digestive system works so if an elephant were to eat a squirrel I don't think its body would know how to how, how to decompose it properly so it, it can only only eat plants so let me explain it to you like this. Obviously, the carnivores, which are the predators, so the animals that eat meat, they have a special digestive system that allows them to break down all the proteins in the meat. Now, herbivores, which are the animals that eat vegetables, so leaves and grass like we've been talking about, and fruit, they have a different type of digestive system that can digest, this is a big word, the cellulose in a lot of plants and the proteins that they have too. So the reason why the carnivores have to eat, so the predators like the lions and the leopards and the hyenas, they have to eat the herbivores, the impala, the kudu, the elephants, all these other animals, 
because their body doesn't know how to digest the grass. So how cool is that? So that's the circle of life. Nature gives you one animal that will eat the grass and the leaves and is able to digest it and make them big and strong. And then that means that there's another animal that can come through and can eat that, that animal, which, you know, is pretty epic, I think. Let's see if they're going to pick up some branches there. They might be looking for roots. You see, look how it's using its foot. They have the most amazing way that they will be able to dig up any bulbs or any roots underneath the ground. They'll use their tusks to dig with. They'll use their feet. And he's eating sticks now. Now, Lars, you've asked a fantastic question today. So, Lars, have you got all your big teeth that have come through yet? Or are you still getting some? I think I only got all my big teeth and I was quite late. I was a late bloomer. Now that's actually a tooth. That tusk that's sticking out over there. But it's not used how we use our teeth. So they don't bite into an apple and chew down with their tusks. They use them as digging tools. So at times like this, when there isn't much grass and leaves around, they can almost go down onto their knees, stick their tusks into the ground, move the, the soil and sand about and find a root. They'll also use it to dig for water. Well, how cool is that? So there's some areas where the rivers have all dried up, so there's just sand, but there's still water underneath all that sand. And the elephants know this, so they use their... They use their feet, they use their tusks, they also use their trunk to scoop out all that sand until they get the nice fresh water. But they don't have to worry about that because they are here at Chitwa Dam which has got lots and lots of water. Now it isn't just me taking you on this wonderful safari. My friend Scotty is out in the Mara and he's managed to find the fastest cat in the world. Hello everyone and it's great to have all of you on board. My name's Scott and I'm teamed up with James on camera. Now I'm very happy that you guys have all jumped onto my vehicle because we are desperately trying to find you a cheetah and I've had no luck. So I'm hoping with your all of your eyes, the fact that you guys are younger than me your eyes probably work a little bit better. I'm hoping we're gonna find you an animal not with big tusks like the elephants you were talking about with Taylor but rather sharp teeth. So, we got a report from some of the other safari guides on our little radio that's very useful for us because people tell us where the different animals are. There's just so much space for the animals to hide in that if we don't work together as a team, it'd be very difficult to find what we're looking for. So let's just take a look up ahead of us here. I need all of you guys to concentrate as much as you can and see if we can find this cheetah. Now, it has got very good camouflage. It's going to blend in very well. Can you see anything there? It looks like there could be something there. Look at that. It's a cheetah. You guys have helped me find it. You guys can definitely come on safari with me again. Oh, I wonder what gave her a fright. And isn't that interesting? Even though she's a big cat, she can be attacked by other animals like lions or leopards, some of the other big cats that are bigger than them. There you can see some other guests on safari and you can also see hundreds and hundreds of wildebeest in the background and that's because it is the great migration here in Kenya. Millions of wildebeest have made it into this area from the country which is just below us. Look at that. Very good. Well, let's try and get closer to that cheetah and get you a better view and while we get closer I can answer a question from Cara Lee. You would like to know what is the difference between a cheetah and a leopard? It's a good question Cara and basically um, leopards are a little bit more stocky, they, they've got bigger muscles than the cheetah. Cheetah are, are skinny but very fast. They're the fastest mammal on the planet and cheetahs, uh, sorry leopards like I say are a little bit stronger than cheetah and they can also climb trees which cheetah cannot. When we get a little bit closer I'll show you that cheetah have got tear marks that run down their eyes along the side of their nose whereas leopards don't have that and also the leopard's uh, patterns on its body are different to the spots of a cheetah. So what I'll do is get us into a good spot over here 
We're so, so lucky to be seeing this animal. There's not a lot of them here in the Mara. This is one of two ladies that we see, and we've been spending the last six months spending a lot of time with this lady, and her name is Kekenya. So let's take a closer look now. We're gonna get such a good view of her. There you can see, beautiful. Oh, nice big yawn, and there you can see her sharp teeth. Can you see what I mean about that tear mark that runs down from her eye along the side of her nose? So that's a very distinctive feature of the cheetah. What has she spotted? Now, she looks like she could be hungry. And, oh, nice big stretch. So she could be looking for some food. Even though the, they are the fastest animal out here, their prey are also very quick. So it's not easy for them to catch their food and sometimes they can go for days without catching anything. So there we go, you can also see she's got very distinctive spots on her body and what I would like to do is ask your teacher Mr. Moore to possibly bring up a picture of a leopard and show you the difference between the kind of patterns on a leopard's body compared to the spots of the cheetah. Well, aren't we lucky, guys? Something also that's very important to remember, and I'm sure a lot of you with pet cats at home will know, that they like sleeping, sometimes for 16 to 20 hours every single day, which is twice as long as we sleep for. So the fact that we're seeing her up and on the move now means that we are very, very lucky. Very good. Well, we are going to get into a better spot. We're going to have to move ahead of her, and while we get into position, we're going to send you back to Taylor, who's looking at another predator with sharp teeth, although this one lives in the water. Wow, look at this one. Now, we've seen the elephants and I said to you that they are the top dogs out here in the wilderness. Nobody messes with a big elephant bull. Even the lions will give him space to walk past. But here is what we call the apex predator. So this is the top predator of all the animals in Africa and it is a crocodile it's not an alligator so we don't get any alligators out here and this is a Nile crocodile now it's not a very big one my goodness if Scotty was anywhere near the Mara River he would be able to show you some monster crocodiles this one is only a it's not very big maybe only about three and a half meters long but they can get much much bigger than that and look it's so hot today it's got its mouth open it's trying to cool itself down Ooh, here's a good question from Eva now you've asked if crocodiles can drown and if you could outrun a crocodile so I don't think crocodiles drown very often they're very good swimmers they've got a very long powerful tail which they use as almost like a fin and they just move that from side to side in the water and that propels them forward and then they also use their feet to move around and paddle a bit in the water too so they're very very good at swimming but if something were to happen to the crocodile maybe it became injured in the water it could but they can also hold their breaths for a very, 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 very long time. Can anybody guess how long a crocodile can hold its breath for? Let's see if any of you know the answer, so I'll wait for that. And now, in terms of outrunning a crocodile, Eva, whew, I don't think so. I've watched some of those crocodiles running on the banks of the Zambezi River, so that's very sandy there, and I couldn't believe my eyes. Even though this one is not moving too quickly now, if something were to give it a fright or if it were to see something that it could eat, it would go sprinting into the water. So they lift themselves up and then they run, run, run with their legs. They're actually quite quick. Now, Cooper, you've just asked about to swim very well and um, so it's not like a leopard or a cheetah or a lion that will use their tails for balance you know if they're running really fast or climbing up trees crocodiles don't have to worry about climbing up trees and um, they're not really running so fast that they have to turn at the last second like a cheetah does when it's chasing after gazelle so crocodiles will use that to help make them move forward when they're in the water but very nice to see though Wow, now you are all very, very lucky today. You've had elephants, you've had cheetah, crocodiles, and now 
the last member of the team. His name is Steve and he's got the most endangered carnivore in South Africa. Good afternoon, or should I say good morning, boys and girls. Welcome to my vehicle. And indeed, we have got the most endangered carnivore on the southern hemisphere, or on the southern part of Africa. The, the wild dog, or the painted dog. And indeed, my name is Steve. I'm joined on camera by VM, the wildebeest. He has just come down from Kenya as well, just to be on the back of the camera, so as to be my cameraman today. Please ask your teacher questions. Raise your hand in class. Let her know when you've got something to say, and then she'll feed it through to us. Let's go back over to these wild dogs. These that you're looking at right now is four little puppies four little wild dog puppies that are about six maybe seven months old you can see that they're all in a little bundle they're panting very heavily um, they are still very young this is probably the hottest day they've ever experienced Fahrenheit for them it's very very warm and they're covered in fur uh, this morning they had a little bit of a meal of a small antelope and all they're trying to do now is hide in the little shade that they have sort of in a dry riverbed at the moment a little bank over there and the sun is obviously on the western side and they've been whining and crying a little bit they're trying to tell mum it's too hot I don't want to be out here <laughs> and there they are all together you see the beautiful colors the tri colors they call it the brown the dark black and the white here we go you can see a little youngster here we go look at those enormous ears obviously use them very well for keeping themselves out in the wilderness hello Gabby P you want to know if, they, if wild dogs act like home dogs well they are a pack animal they work in a family um, they hunt together as a family they have lots and lots of behaviors that are very similar to dogs back home the way that they urinate the way that they they defecate and spray and they smell absolutely everything they lick each other they smell each other they're very chirpy very giggly uh, but they are an endangered wildlife animal they are indigenous to southern Africa and they are very similar to wolves uh, they probably changed from a distant 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 time ago to live on the African continent and wolves decided to be a bit more shaggy and live in the more colder areas uh, so their behavior is very similar to that but they are a family they're meant to be together in a group so I suppose if you had five or six dogs at home and if you watch how they behave probably quite similar hello Carmen you want to know about the colors the brown and the black when they are born they are completely black with just a tip of the tail being white that is how wild dogs look when they're born and the black helps them to stay quite warm because it's a little bit cold when they're born and they're quite small so the black keeps them nice and warm and as they get a bit older like this the brown the white and the black combined is actually a very very good camouflage so what they can do is they can try and sneak up on certain animals on certain prey animals that they might be looking for small impala or small steenbok I'm sure we'll be able to find you one or two of those and once they can get as close as they can like then they chase the animal down they are very very fit long marathon runners they can run and run and run and they chase the animals as far as they need to until eventually the animals are too tired to run away and then they catch them and it can always be quite interesting to see because they act as a family and they behave very nicely together as a family which is very very good they share their food they don't uh, steal from each other at all it's a very nice sort of family just like we all have you know so beautiful beautiful wild dogs the most endangered carnivore in southern Africa and we will try and get to another position for you so we can see them a little bit more clearly we kind of like down on a drainage line let's go all the way up to Kenya with Scott one endangered carnivore to another you guys are getting absolutely spoiled I'm so happy you got to see those wild dog puppies now she's just perched on a small little termite mound it's giving her a little bit of extra height so that she can use her beady eyes to scan these vast open plains for her next meal and like I said earlier it's really difficult for all of the predators not only the cheetah to actually catch their food so like I said despite them being very very fast all of the prey animals have been designed in a way that they can have a very good chance of escaping so she's just taking her time 
looking for her next opportunity. Hello Olivia, you would like to know why do cheetah run so fast? It's a good question. Um, all of the different animals that Mother Nature has created have got kind of different uh, benefits or, or different strengths and weaknesses. So the cheetah hunts alone and it lives in very open landscapes and because of that it needs to be very fast because there's often not many bushes for it to use to hide to creep up to its prey whereas an animal like a leopard they're very secretive and like to live more in thick bushes and area areas where they can hide and therefore they don't need to be as fast because they've got better cover to be able to sneak up and catch their food and the reason why the leopard is different to the cheetah and both of them are different to lion is that they, so that they can uh, live in slightly different areas in the same place and not only that they, that they also can catch different food if they all ate the same thing then there possibly wouldn't be enough food for one of them but cheetah tend to eat smaller animals because they hunt alone uh, so do leopard because leopard also live alone but lions have been clever and they've realized that by joining together and hunting as a team and living as a team they can catch bigger food so it's a very good question um, I guess even all the different antelopes some of them can run faster than others so all of the animals are slightly different. And I guess it's just like us as humans. Some of us are fast, some of us are slow, some of us are good at football, some are good at hockey. And it's the same with the wild animals out here. Paxton, you would like to know, why did I say that cheetahs sleep so much? And I just thought it was quite interesting that they spend so much time sleeping. And I guess the reason why they spend a lot of time sleeping, it's not necessarily because they're lazy. Oh, there go some more tourists coming to join in on the action here. But because they need to save their energy. Like I said, it's very difficult for them to catch their food. So if they were running around all day using up their energy, they might not have enough energy to catch their food. So they like to not be lazy, but be clever in that by spending a lot of time sleeping and relaxing when it is time to go hunting and when it is time to run as fast as they can they've got enough energy to do so and it's not just the cheetah lion and leopard are also the same they all like to sleep a lot all of the big cats as do your house cats at home very good Taylor is still at the waterhole and she's found some other animals that she would like to show you Look at all the things that we're seeing here today. Now those are hippos and there's actually a lot of little hippos there. But before we get too excited, are you ready to make some more noise in the classroom? I know that's what I was always excited about. Now the hippos make a very, very interesting sound. Maybe you can remember when we had the elephants at the edge of the dam, they were making a noise. Did you hear that? But I'm going to try my best to make the sound of a hippo and then I'm going to count to three and I want you all to also try and then we have to try and pick a winner. Well, maybe you, someone can choose who they think did the best hippo sound. Are you ready? I'm very nervous now. I don't do this very well, but they sound something like this. Can you all do that? Are you ready? I'll do it once more, just in case you didn't know. I don't know. They sound something like that. On on three. One, two, three. Did you all do it? Senzo is now clapping for me. Well done to all of you. I think I maybe heard it. I was trying to listen very, very carefully. So we'll try and see who we think did the best hippo call. But let's have another look. Let's see. Oh, there's one. I think it's going to try and copy us now. How cool is that? Did you hear them? It's a bit windy, so I don't know if you could hear them so well, but they're singing back to all of you. Now, Aiden, you've asked if hippos float. So th the hippo is actually not floating there. They're standing on the bottom of the water. Sorry, something is stinging. Senzo, what got you, Senzo? I don't know. I think it's a fly. 
something is just bitten, Senzo. That's the thing when you're out here on a safari, is that bees and wasps and all sorts of bitey things. I was bitten by an assassin bug the other day. It got stuck in my T-shirt. That was not very fun. So uh, we have to worry about them. So sorry, Aiden. Just going back to your question very quickly, is that the hippos aren't floating. They're actually standing on the bottom of the, uh, of the surface underneath all that water. So it's not very deep. Hippos don't really like the deep water too much. They prefer the shallower water. And that's because they don't swim very well. Don't you think it's a little bit strange that an animal that lives in the water all day long can't swim very well? That's because they remind me of men that go to the moon. They remind me of astronauts. So they sink to the bottom of the floor, they walk, and then they, or they can run along the bottom too. How cool is that? Maybe some of you have been to some zoos and have seen hippos in enclosures where they've got clear glass and you can see straight in. I'd love to see what a hippo looks like underwater, but you also don't want to get into the water with hippo because they're very, very dangerous. Very dangerous indeed. So like I said, these are some of the baby hippos. We always like to joke and say that they're only called potamuses at this age. And then when they get to about two years old, then they become hippopotamuses because they're so cute and so small. I wish some of them would come out of the water so I could show you their little legs. But even with such little legs, they can run really fast. I wonder who would win if a crocodile and a hippo were to have a race on land. Who would you put your money on, Senzo? The crocodile says Senzo. I think I'm going to choose the hippo. Now, Carmen, you've asked a question about why are the hippos so dangerous? Well, Carmen, even though they're just here sitting in the water, enjoying their day, and they only eat grass, hippos are very dangerous. Now, remember I said you mustn't go swimming with them, so that's one reason, because they'll be very upset. It's like if somebody were to come into your home, but they didn't knock on the door, they didn't ring the doorbell. You would not be happy that they were in there without your permission. So the hippos are doing, doing the same thing. That is their home, the water, so they're very protective over it. And then the hippos have to come out and eat grass, and there's no grass floating around in the water. So as the sun goes down, at last light, the hippos will leave the water and then they'll go off and search for food. But sometimes, like now at this time of the year, they have to walk a very, very long way to try and find green grass, although there isn't really any green grass. Actually, just finding grass is hard enough. So they go and they do that. And then the problem comes when they're on their way back to the water. So hippos feel very safe, as we've chatted about, inside the water. So if you come between a hippo and the water, you're going to find yourself in a little bit of trouble. Senzo, has that fish eagle got something? Let's see. I don't know if it's got something in between its talons. I think it does. Look at that. No, it doesn't. I made it up. I got excited. I thought it had a fish. That is not a bald eagle. That is one of the most beautiful birds in Africa called an African fish eagle. And it makes a sound like this. But it also doesn't really sound the way I'm going to make it. But maybe we'll be lucky enough to hear the beautiful call of the fish eagle because it's one of the best sounds to hear in Africa. Also hippos singing, which we've already heard, so we're lucky today. But let's go see if the puppies that Steve is sitting with are surviving this very hot day. Yes, well, there's a very nice breeze coming in from the north, which is very nice and cooling us down. But what we've done is we've positioned the camera in a way. I wonder if you can remember where those wild dogs were. Look very closely. There we go. They're moving now. One or two are moving. Now, VM's going to go in. You can look closely. See how well those brown and black with the white really, really help them to, to blend in with the background so that they're not easily seen by other animals, which is exactly the purpose of it, so that they can hide. So the question earlier about do they behave like dogs, well have a look at that nose, isn't that a very dog-like nose? A very sandy nose as well, where they're sticking their nose into everything. If you've ever taken your dog for a walk, it likes to sniff and put its nose in absolutely everything. And those very, very big ears for listening out for danger.
Hello Brian, you want to know how big a wild dog can get? And I'm going to tell you probably about 45, maybe 50 pounds at the most. Maybe 60 pounds at the most. Not much bigger than that. Um, they're not built for strength. Uh, they're built for, for stamina and endurance and for running very long distances. But we're just looking at the little puppies here and they're still very small. They've still got a bit of growing to do. And if we could find you one of the adults that was in a very nice place, we'd, we'd show you. But they look very much the same. They're just a little bit bigger, in fact. But very beautiful, aren't they? So special to be able to see them. Today was the first time, boys and girls, I've ever seen wild dog puppies in the wild in my life. How amazing is that? And Finn, yes, they do run very quickly. Um, they've probably got a, a, a running speed. I'm going to try and work it out for you. They can probably run at about 45, yeah, 45 kilometers an hour. So probably about 20 odd. 20 odd miles an hour they can run and they can keep that up for a very 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 long time I might be a little bit off with my maths there but left or right of that number and they can just run and run and run very very fit lots and lots of stamina and that is what they do they tire out their animals they don't have claws like leopards and lions do so they have to chase them until they pull them down hello Kara well a very good question about what's the difference between hyena and wild dog. Well, first of all, the colors. Um, hyena is a sort of a brown color with these sort of beige sort of whitish spots all over. They're a lot bigger individually. They don't have white like that. They do kind of look a little bit like a dog, although the head is a little bit bigger and the body is sloped quite strangely. Um, the body it kind of arches back, whereas the shoulders are a bit taller than the, the, the hindquarters, whereas in dogs they generally are quite square, quite level with the shoulders and the back, and they don't operate in the same sort of system. So that's probably one of the biggest differences is the system that they operate in. Now, wild dogs have got sort of two leaders, the female and the male, both the alpha and alpha male and alpha female, and they're in charge of everything. They're the ones who have the puppies, Whereas in hyena clans, there is a big female who's in charge generally, generally a big female. And their behavior is quite different because uh, they're quite a good scavenger. They're also quite fit and lots of stamina, the hyena. But they generally scavenge and chase, lion, chase away lions or try to chase away lions and chase away leopards, even wild dog from their kills. Wild dogs only eat fresh meat that they've caught themselves. They don't they don't steal meat from anybody else very similar to a cheetah cheetahs are very fast they're not very strong like wild dogs and so they rely on their speed to catch their fresh meat which they don't share with anyone let's go to Scott up in the Mara who will tell you all about it well they certainly are similar to cheetah but as Steve was saying wild dogs are very good at running at high speeds for long long distances whereas the cheetah is good at running faster than anyone but only for a short distance a cheetah can only run for about 20 to 30 seconds at the most at high speed now I know you were discussing the differences between wild dog and hyena with Stephen earlier you asked me what the difference was between leopard and cheetah and I've made a little plan on my phone to be able to show you guys Ooh, interesting I can hear a jackal calling and the jackals actually alarm calling at the cheetah Let's creep forward a bit and see if we can't get you a view of the, of the jackal. A jackal's a small little fox-like animal and you could have heard it going <coughs> And the reason why it's alarm calling is because just like I said earlier, just how cheetah might not be safe if there is a lion around or a leopard around, this jackal isn't safe with a cheetah around. The predators aren't very nice to one another. So here we're gonna be able to get you a good view of both the cheetah and the jackal. The jackal's just directly over the cheetah now. And soon you will see it. Where is it? It's somewhere now, like I said, those small little animals, it was somewhere there just a second ago. Where did it disappear to? Let's keep looking there for a second. I'm not too sure how it could have disappeared so quickly. Huh. 
Well, you never know what's going to happen on safari. So, we'll have to just wait a moment and hopefully the jackal will come out. Eva, you would like to know how do we protect ourselves against cheetah? Well, to be honest, we don't really need to protect ourselves against any of the wild animals so long as we stay in the vehicle. And they've become used to us in the vehicle. We never chase them or hurt them or harm them. And also, very importantly, we never feed them. And it's only when you feed wild animals that they begin to lose their natural fear of us. And that is when you can get into trouble. So if you ever see a sign that says, do not feed the animals, it's for a good reason. Um, so we basically are just spectators. We don't help them, we don't hurt them. And for many years of doing that, we kind of have become invisible. We kind of just like a rock. So they don't see us as a food source, thankfully. Um, Thankfully though, even if uh, cheetah aren't very happy with us, they are not going to give us a hard time. Lion and leopard on the other hand, they can be a little bit more dangerous to us as humans, but most of the time we are okay. Now I've spotted the jackal, it's slinking around close to that tree at about two o'clock there James, the one to the right of the one with the vulture in, just to the right of that. There it goes, to the right, James. Oh, well done, there it is, finally. So that is the black back jackal that you could hear calling earlier. And I just want to call you back quickly to look at me now, just so I can show you the difference between cheetah and leopard quickly, now that we've got a glimpse of the jackal that you could hear calling earlier. And what I've done is I've got two pictures on my phone one of a cheetah and one of a leopard. And as James continues to zoom in, you will notice um, that, let me just hold the phone nice and still so James can zoom all the way in. And you'll notice that the cheetah has got distinctive little spots on the top, whereas the leopard at the bottom has kind of got like a round black circle with a little gold spot in the middle, which is called the rosette. So that's one way of telling the difference. And then if we look at the next picture, you can clearly see the tear marks running down the cheetah's face from her eyes on either side of her nose, whereas the leopard below doesn't have those tear marks. So quite different when you put them next to one another, and I hope that helps you guys. Very, very good. Well, we are going to probably stay put here with this cheetah, and I'm not sure if I'm going to see you guys again, so I would like to say goodbye to you all, and I'd like to just teach you one quick saying in Kiswahili, which is the local language that is spoken here in Kenya, and that is to say thank you, because I want all of you guys to say thank you to Mr. Moore for being such a cool teacher, because I'm sure there's lots of school kids that are probably doing maths or something else right now, but you guys are on safari with us. So, to say Asante Sana Mr. Moore on three. Let's, let me get you ready, let me, let me show you and you can see me saying it one more time just so you get it right. Asante Sana. So on three, I want you to all say Asante Sana Mr. Moore. Are you ready? One, two, three. Asante Sana Mr. Moore. Good to have you guys on Safari. Make sure you guys try and follow us, tell your parents about us and maybe they can help you get us, get you back onto the vehicle. But for now, we're gonna send you back to either Steve or Taylor. You got me, it's Taylor again. Look at the birds. Now, we've been looking at all of the really cool big animals, but I thought we better show some bird appreciation. Now, the big one, that stands out with the black and white feathers with a red beak. That is called a saddle-billed stork. And it's one of the biggest storks that we see out here. And then there are lots and lots of Egyptian geese. I'm sure you get lots of different types of geese back at home. And you know that sometimes they can be a bit of a pest. There are so many of them here. So, so many. Oh, look, there's even some more animals that have come down to drink just to the left. Those are called nyala. And that one that's coming to drink now is a young boy. He isn't fully grown just yet. He's still getting his adult colors and his horns have still got a lot of growing to do. And then that's the girl on the right. So you can see a lot of the antelope species out here, the boys have horns and then the girls don't have horns. But then, 
of course there are some that both boys and girls have got horns but none that we're looking at right now so on a hot day it's important to come out and have a drink of water but they must be very very careful because it could be a leopard or a lion just hidden in the grass so they won't stay for too long now Liam the storks typically have got very very long legs and maybe that's got something to do with the way that they they feed so the things that they go after so the stork is here at the edge of the water and they are really really good at fishing so you'll see them walking through quite deep water because they're a very tall bird and then they can go and eat fish they can eat frogs they can eat baby crocodiles this bird is big enough to eat baby crocodiles so they better be very careful and there are lots in this dam too so that's why they've got long legs so nature is really amazing all the animals don't want to compete with one another so all the birds that eat fish don't want to have to uh, fish in the same spot so that means that the smaller birds that will eat fish so you get some birds called herons which aren't as tall as say for example the the stork they can fish on the edge of the water and then that saddle built stork can walk out right to the middle and go and fish there if they like to so it's a, it's basically a, a, a way that um, um, animals will help stop the competitiveness if you will with trying to find food so even look at the mammals so like a giraffe and an elephant they, a, a giraffe has got a long neck to feed on tops of the trees an elephant also has a long trunk it can reach up and grab the leaves but then there aren't really any other animals that can feed all the way up to the tops of the trees the other animals have to feed lower down so there's no competition. Grady, now you've asked about how does the black and white feathers on this bird protect it. I don't think it's got feathers to help it camouflage. I don't think this bird needs to worry about camouflage too much. There aren't going to be too many things that will be going after it. Something like a crocodile might want to eat it, maybe a young crocodile or maybe a really big eagle or some young predators so like some young lions and leopards but this bird is lucky it can fly it's got long legs it can go out to the to deep water so it's fairly safe so that's just the colors that it was given whereas the egyptian geese they've got more browns on them and that of course because they're much smaller and you'll find that there's lots of things that would want to eat a, an egyptian goose and um, they need some camouflage uh, to to sort of help them Awesome. Well, it has been so much fun chatting to you all, and I hope you have a, had a good day. And I hope that some of you want to become a safari guide just like me one day. I look forward to that. But have a great day at school further. I'm going to send you to Steve now so that you can see the puppies for one last time. We are still with the puppies indeed, Taylor. Thank you. It's probably my favorite day of the year. Second time today finding these puppies and spending time with them. It is very, very special, I must tell you. How many times have you seen puppies before, VM? Mm, lots of times. Okay, he's seen lots of times. I haven't. Only my second time and my first day ever. So very, very exciting to be able to spend time with them. And normally they're quite busy. They were quite active this morning and running around. But now they are very hot, as we discussed, and they're just trying to stay out of the sun. Hello, Rylan. You want to know why they've got such big ears? Well, there's lots of things out here that are dangerous for them, and they need to be able to hear them before the animal gets too close. Uh, also, they can use it for catching animals, so they can hear animals in the distance, uh, and maybe they can move in that direction. It's all about safety. If you have ears that big, well, nothing's going to get past you. So it's all about hearing things in the distance, being able to react to them. Um, when they lose each other, they can call and they can find each other from a very long way away because they need to stay together. Staying together is their pack. Staying together is their kind of sort of security. So if they lose each other, they'll do this woo call, <laughs> not doing it very well. And with their nice big ears, they'll be able to keep together because they'll hear where they are. They can hear lions coming, they hear leopards coming. This morning we had a hyena trying to sneak up on them and they all got up and chased him off. So so that was very fun to see. So that's the main reason. It's all about safety and communication. Very important out here in the African wilderness to be able to stay together if you're a family unit. One wild dog on its own has a lot of trouble, really a lot of trouble staying out there. They need to be together for the strength. 
Well, boys and girls from Three Oaks Elementary, it has been so fantastic having you with us this afternoon or this morning for you on our Sunset Safari. Thank you for your questions and your interaction. It has been so much fun having you. I hope you've learned some. I hope you're going to take this out and tell your friends and family, and maybe some of you will come to Africa one day and we'll get to have a chat. But at least then you can know more about the wild dog, the hippo, and the cheetah from Africa. It has been a very, very cool afternoon. Thank you for joining us and we're going to say goodbye to you all thank you for the afternoon and on that note we're going to go over to Taylor McCurdy who I think is still at Chitwood Dam goodbye folks goodbye boys and girls see you next time hello regular viewers welcome to the safari Ooh, I deserve that Whew, almost got attacked by Zizzy Fuss. Right, um, welcome again. How cool was it? That school drives, they got to see lots of amazing things. I'm really, really so happy for all of them. Now, for the rest of you, thank you. Ooh, hang on, we're going back. I think I've seen something that would be quite exciting. So remember to hashtag Safari Live on Twitter and also talk to us via the YouTube chat. I don't, I've seen a bird of prey. And I'm really, really, I don't know why I turned so early either. I'm really hoping that it's a bird that we saw here last year that was nesting in this tree. Or that at least there was a pair that had started building a nest. Let's see first. You see which tree I'm talking about, Essence, or the green one? Oh. Let's just have a look. So there's that branch that runs horizontally, 12 o'clock. There's a bird sitting just up there. Can you see it? Now you can see it on the branch. What are you? Are you a gymnogene? Ooh, it's hard to tell. But to the left, that nest last year was being used by African harrier hawks or a gymnogene. Let me go f closer because I can't tell you what that is. We'll try to sneak up. I'm going to see if I can't roll on in. They're typically quite shy birds. They never really hang around for too long. Need some speed. Don't fly, don't fly. Just got to get over the little bump. Okay, it's just up there. Going to roll in slowly. It could, have been, it could be used by someone else. Is it a Warburg's eagle, maybe? I don't see any grey. There we go. Yeah, it looks like it's a Warburg's eagle just sitting up there. I don't know if it's using that nest, but that nest was actually made by a pair of gymnogenes. It could have stolen the nest. I mean, they make a lot of different nests. You know, sometimes they'll stay and use the same one. But if they felt that it wasn't a particularly good spot, they might move and build a different one. Or it could just be sitting there because it's hot. And it's one of the few trees that actually has leaves on it at the moment. This is a Balanites tree or the Torchwood tree. So that's the other reason. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm a bit sad because I was really, really hoping that it wasn't... I mean, I love the Warburg's eagles. I love seeing our migrants come through. However, I was hoping that it was going to be an African harrier hawk. Yeah, that would have been spectacular to see. Okay. No luck. Right. We're on Chitwa still. We're going to try and find some lions because I heard rumblings that the Styx Pride was here. Off you go back to the Mara with Scotty to see what Kenya is up to. Welcome back, everyone. Sorry that it wasn't the bird you were hoping for, T. Seems like Kenya is just kind of taking it easy. She's obviously not that hungry but she could do with the meal um, I think she's also quite wise in that by sitting and waiting in one spot she knows that she can scan from a distance and hopefully see some adult Thompson's gazelle heading back towards their young fawns which they just stash in the grass and often move off quite a quite a long way off probably half a mile even up to a mile away from their young while they go off in search of food and then every couple of hours they head back to nurse them and it's at that point in time that she will get an idea of where the youngsters are hiding out and then she can launch her attack so just sitting tight for the time being as are we great
prospects. Earlier on, we kind of swung past her at around 2.30 this afternoon and she was just lazing under a tree in the shade. It was really hot early on until the weather turned. The wind picked up and the clouds rolled in and that's when she decided to get up and move and we, we were very lucky in relocating her because we actually left her and headed off in the hope of finding those two tiny lion cubs, the new additions to the sausage tree pride. We've only seen them once the day before yesterday and we haven't seen them since then and I'm hoping that they're still okay. I'm really concerned that the uh, old Donyo Payek males, two males that are mating with Kinky Tail and another lioness from the Sausage Tree Pride, could pose or will pose a massive threat to those youngsters. So let's hope that the three lioness, including the mother of those two cubs, are avoiding them. Very, very good. I've forgotten your name, but one of you would like to know if I've ever seen a king cheetah. No, I haven't. They're incredibly rare to see in the wild. I think um, captively they can be, be bred qu quite well. Once that gene uh, is found, they can kind of keep trying to breed them. So in captivity, I think it's more common, but in the wild, it's very uncommon. And I'm not sure when last there was a king cheetah strolling through the plains of the Mara, if ever. And sorry, Tweety Tweet, um, for forgetting your name. It's a name that I shouldn't have forgotten. Um, so yeah, I've never seen one. I'm not sure if Taylor or Steve have either. Um, again, they are, are very, very rare to see in the wild. Very good. It's incredible how well she blends in. I mean, before James starts zooming in there, it's as if she's not even in the frame. And I guess that's what makes it so hard, why it makes it so hard to find these animals, even in the short green grass like this. Okay, Gary, you'd like to know if a cheetah will kind of only hunt when they're hungry, or are they also entirely opportunistic? Um, it's a good question. I think that they're less inclined to be as gluttonous as lions and take as many opportunities as lions would. Uh, for example, during the migration months, it's not uncommon for lions to catch and kill multiple wildebeest and not even start feeding on them. But I've never seen the same behavior from cheetah. So they tend to mainly kill um, as and when they need to. Um, but that's not to say that, you know, she might be kind of, not starving, but an easy opportunity presents itself to her, she'll take it. And having thought about it, actually, I think back to my first morning ever with the Musketeer Coalition. It was actually an incredible 24 hours. Um, the first time I ever saw them was in the evening, and I actually headed out alone. Um, Jandre, who I was teamed up with on camera, had to go and climb a mast to f help Alex our Russian technical genius uh, to rig, rig up some kind of repeater or something to help our broadcast. So I headed out alone to try and find them. We found them and I was jumping between the driver's seat and the cameraman's spot trying to film them, which was good fun. Then we spent the entire night with them. I remember they slept about 300 me meters away from some lions that were roaring, which was quite a surprise. And then at 5 a.m. they woke up and in the darkness, in the morning twilight, they took down a young wildebeest, fed on it, finished the majority of it between the five of them, and then a hyena came and got the kind of final scraps. So they definitely had a good meal. At about 9 a.m. that morning, they then came across a lone wildebeest, a youngster running around on its own, and they took it down. So... They just had a meal, yet another opportunity presented itself. Of course, they obviously needed a little bit more food, and they cashed in on it. Rosalind, you would like to know if cheetah can see in the dark? Yes, they certainly can. I also think back to uh, uh, a night spent with Malaika, a female cheetah, and her two boys. Um, sadly, she is no longer. Um, she is suspected to have drowned crossing one of the small rivers on the other side of uh, the Mara River from where we are now. And we were sitting with her, it was pitch black, and she basically um, kind of picked her head up and started like looking off in the distance. 
and we naturally thought, well, what is she looking at? And Jean-André zoomed in with a fancy infrared camera, and we could see some zebra walking, probably about 150 meters away from her, so a long way off in pitch blackness, and she could tell there was something there. Whether she could tell that they were zebra, or she wasn't too sure what they were, we'll never be able to know, but she definitely knew something was there, which is quite incredible um, and a big reason uh, why they don't necessarily hunt and, as, and are as active at night as possibly leopard and lion is because they cleverly hunt during the daylight hours when leopard, lion and also hyena are ordinarily less active so they have less chance of bumping into their competitors uh, after dark and I think that's mainly why they don't do too much hunting after dark but it's not to say that they do not hunt after dark because we disprove that with the musketeer coalition filming them take down multiple prey items in pitch blackness from Thompson's gazelle to impala to wildebeest so those are the three animals I remember them catching in the pitch in the pitch of the dark in the middle of the night <laughs> um, so yes they definitely can see at night whether they can see as well as leopard or lion I'm not too sure but they definitely can see Wonderful stuff. Well, we are getting absolutely spoiled rotten this afternoon, or at least you guys are, because you have the joy of jumping from vehicle to vehicle. And now you're jumping back on board with Steve and the wild dog pups. Yes, exactly, Scott. They are, everybody is being treated beautifully this afternoon, and I think myself and VM are the luckiest, actually. As we get to sit here, beautiful breeze coming from behind. Hello, everybody. We are still with these wild dog puppies. I don't know. They're not going to be able to pull me away from them this afternoon, I don't think. Why would we go do anything else if we've got wild dog pups? Have them. <laughs> I think we'll spend a bit more time here, and maybe as it starts to cool down, maybe we'll get them jumping up on top of the termite mound here. Maybe they're going to get up and go for a drink. I don't think they've gone for a drink at all since we've seen them. Otherwise, they came all the way back here, and Gallagher Pan is that direction not very far but I doubt they would have come all the way back if they had gone and had a drink but um, as soon as it cools down to the right degree I'm sure those adults will stand up give a little whimper or a little contact call and these round bellied little puppies will get very excited and follow suit super blessed to be seeing them I know I keep saying that, but we don't. I mean, when last did, do you know, VM, when last we had wild dog pups on the property? Probably two years ago. Yes, VM reckons about two years ago. John, in Africa, how many packs of wild dogs? Sure, I have an absolutely no idea. I don't know. Um, the, the number is nowhere near where it should be, that's for sure. Uh, there's plenty of habitat. Well, there used to be plenty of habitat and space for the wild dogs, but due to human encroachment, habitat loss, agriculture, the fact that wild dogs are predators and will hunt down and eat lambs and sheep and uh, small cows, I think. Maybe not a small cow, possibly. They are a, a pest to the farmer, and they've been eradicated in many, many areas. They're sort of quite nomadic in the way that they move and the way that they hunt. So the pressure that they put on an area, if the area is big enough, is not very large, but as soon as you make an area quite small and fence it in, well, then you put the predator, the, the prey numbers under a huge amount of pressure. So I couldn't tell you how many there are in Africa. Africa is an enormous continent, but south of the sub -Sahara, south of the Sahara, and there'll be a number of number of packs. Mmm. Cenac, yes, they, they, I think they, they've completely stopped suckling by now. I think up until about three, maybe three and a half months, I think three months they're actually weaned somewhere around there. And then from that point, they, it's almost an exclusive meat diet. Before they um, finish suckling, they're still getting a bit of meat. They get quite sort of greedy and they like to beg the adults that have gone off on a on the foraging hunt on the scavenge on the scavenge on the hunt and uh, they'll come back with bellies full of meat which they'll then regurgitate for the youngsters who will gobble it up at a rate of knots so they get introduced to meat at an early age but it's only now in the last little while that they've been invited out to follow the the adults uh, on their hunting forays and uh, the adults will probably work better as four 
Uh, but these six individuals, I can only see... Oh, they're all there now. One, two, three, four... Yeah, all there now. Wow, Lady Macbeth has found the answer. 1,400 breeding pairs of dogs in the whole of Africa. Now, that is very interesting. Obviously, there's a lot of conservation efforts that are going out, and a lot of people probably are researching this, and it's very well researched down in South Africa at the moment. So throughout Africa, that's actually not a lot of animals. Um, and each of those breeding pairs would have a family unit to them. So each of them could be a breakaway, could be an established uh, family or pack. So very interesting. Thank you for that, Lady Macbeth. That is not a lot if you think about the amount of space we have in Africa. Africa is an enormous continent. But uh, as I say, it's agriculture and the interference with humans. Wow, I'm getting lots of interesting facts today. Thank you, Danielle. Daniel, Daniel has given us the information that there's 18 muscles in a wild dog's ear. Well, thank you, Daniel. I'm definitely never going to forget that, because 18 is the amount of pups a wild dog can have. How's that? I don't think that's the average, but they can have that many. That's, oh, there you go. There's a nice, cool spot. I'm going to roll down the hill. Very special. So it's definitely slowly starting to cool down. Um, the adults that I can just see one. She's not very visible to to the camera. I think it's a she. It might not be a she. And just <laughs> just to the left of that tamburi bro. There we go. There's the ear. <laughs> there we go. All 18 muscles being used right now. All 18 muscles there. Beautiful shot. Well done, Viem. That was a beautiful shot of her ear. Uh, that's why we haven't shown you yet, because she's not in the best, or that individual is not in the best position. And we're in a good position. Well, the best position we can get for these youngsters. Very cute. And Diana, there are six puppies here. I believe the first time they were spotted, there were seven from the rangers in the Manuleti. Um, so there's six. I'm not sure how many you've been informed of before, uh, but that's the information I heard this morning, that there were seven originally seen. There might have been more before that, I don't know. But um, there's been six here today. Yes, Diane, I'm sorry if I might have confused you. I could only see four puppies earlier that were sitting together in a little puddle, and two of them were a little bit off to the back. And now they're all there together, all six of them. All puddled together, a puppy puddle, as someone mentioned on Twitter earlier today. Okay, fantastic. Well, it seems like Taylor has moved on from her sightings at Chitwa, and let's go over to her and see exactly what she's going to get up to. Well, I'm trying to find the lions, but I have no idea where they are, and I suspect that they're in a non-signal area. So I thought, well, Hosanna has been hanging around, so we might as well go and check up on him. So we're making our way back towards Juma now. We're still quite far off um, from where we need to get to, but we'll probably go past uh, Twin Dance, almost forgot what it was called, and just check. There probably won't be anything there because nothing seems to like drinking from that, no, that leftover water. It looks quite gross. So um, we'll carry on in that direction and then hopefully a little bit later we will have Hosanna. How exciting. So I'll need your help in case he does come back towards the dam camp, so keep an eye out. Right, off you go, back to Scott, who's with his favorite animal. Imagine if you get Kakenya, the wild dog, and Hosanna all on one afternoon on safari. Possibly even Kakenya making a kill. She's up and on the move now, and that's why we are on the move as well. Just trying to stay ahead of her in the event that she does flush a young fawn from 
these open plains and it's really incredible to think that a young Thompson's gazelle can lie out in the open and yet still be camouflaged and hide from predators. But the problem is is sometimes they don't back their camouflage and they jump up when the cheetah gets close thus giving away their position and obviously allowing the cheetah to do its thing and unleash its almighty speed as she chases after them. So, just going to stop here. She's kind of going to walk straight in front of those tourists over there. That guy did a great job in getting them into a good spot ahead of her. And earlier on she was kind of sniffing around and she did a few circles in one area. So I'm wondering if she didn't perhaps spot a fawn or if she's just feeling lucky. It's hard to be certain. When my folks were out here the, the other day, um, you guys were on board with Brent and it was just the two of us in the sighting together. And I did a massive loop ahead of her and got on the other side of two adult Thompson's gazelle. And I told my parents we're in pole position if she in fact tries to catch an adult. But because we've looped so far ahead of her, we run the risk of missing the action if she perhaps flushes a fawn. And literally, as I finished that sentence, boop, a fawn popped up and she chased after it and caught it. So, you kind of got to be ready for anything. It also reminds me of my first morning spending time with Manu and Cheetah. It was the first time Manu had ever filmed Cheetah in the wild. And Malaika and her two boys were heading through a kind of swampy section. Uh, that's often home to reed buck and I said to Manu just be careful a reed buck or a scrub hair or anything could pop up out of here and again within seconds chup, a scrub head popped out and Manu within an hour of filming cheetah and seeing cheetah for the first time in the wild he filmed them making a kill so we do have to be ready for anything now one thing that I'm not expecting her to do is try and catch a wildebeest but Anything can happen out here, and if we take a quick look around to the left, we will be able to see that there is a large amount of wildebeest not far from where we are that she's heading straight towards. This is actually, I'm going to reposition quickly. This is looking promising. She's kind of slinking, so hold on. Carol, you would like to know what exactly is a king cheetah? Um, it's essentially uh, just a melanistic uh, version. Uh, so it's just got a, a different kind of uh, pigmentation. It's a darker form of a regular cheetah. So yeah, it's just a genetic variation. Uh, just like sometimes you get leucistic leopard or even black leopard, you also sometimes get the king cheetah, which are just a darker version. What? This is some incredible news from Rianni, who saw not one but two king cheetahs in the Kruger National Park a few years ago. That is epic. Lucky you. Um, again, I've, no one I know has ever seen a king cheetah. So that is an incredible incredibly fortunate thing to have witnessed and thank you for sharing that with us we're going to get some epic quintessential mara two shots here with a migrating herd of wildebeest and a cheetah let me just get into pole position this will probably work quite well there we go now even though i'm not expecting her to catch a wildebeest Anything can happen, Archer. Oh, and they've decided to all flee, so there goes the two-shot opportunity. But she's at 2.30, James. Yeah, I'll just keep zooming in, you'll... A little bit to the right. A little bit more there, you can just see a little white spot, which is Kakenya. So, as I was saying, she, she's, you know, just being clever, I guess, and having a look, doing some window shopping. She could possibly have spotted a injured youngster. And even though wildebeest, even youngsters, are difficult for an adult cheetah to take down at this age, if they're injured, she would possibly have a go at one. 
And look at all those wildebeest in the background. Absolutely awesome. Epic, epic scenes. James, you would like to know if Kakenya has been seen mating uh, since she lost the cubs. Nope, she hasn't been seen mating, but that's not to say that she hasn't. And I'm, of course, hoping that she has, because if that is the case, how long ago did she lose those cubs? Probably about two months ago. She could have mated as soon as two weeks after losing those cubs, which means in a month and a half's time, there could be more cheetah cubs. Which also brings me to the kind of point that she could well have given birth to six litters of cubs since she raised Naratoi and Naratoi's siblings to adulthood. So, so yeah, I mean, that's a scary statistic. It's been three years, I think, since she set Naratoi and her siblings free. It was uh, two girls and two boys, so she raised four cubs to adulthood, of which Naratoi was one. But since then, she has had no joy, which gives you an idea of how hard it is for Cheetah to raise cubs out here. She's lost some to buffalo. I'm guessing some to lion, possibly some to hyena as well. She nearly lost some to a big male leopard, this recent litter. Um, but yeah, James, uh, no confirmed sightings of her mating, but let's hope that she has in fact found some men since she lost the cubs. MGM, you'd like to know what does the word cheetah mean? I don't have the foggiest idea. If anybody does, please spread the word. It's a good question. <laughs> oh, interesting. Well, Luigi, in the final control, he's giving Nikki a hand in directing the show, has got onto the Google machine. Thank you, Luigi, for saving me. And apparently it means hunting leopard. I'm not sure what language. Um, but it means a hunting leopard in, in some language. She seems to be moving with a bit of intent now. What have you spotted, Kikenya? Why are you moving like you are? Let me swing the vehicle around quickly. It's beginning to rain, which is not ideal. Lots of Tommies over there. She's seen lots more Tommies, and those Tommies could well have youngsters. I'm guessing that is what, in, in fact, is happening. Let me get my bearings. Where is she now? Oh, there she is. Okay, hold on to your handbags, everyone. Oop, doink, doink. There's a whole bunch of Tommies here. And it sounds like, it seems like this could be a good situation. Oh, I can see baby Tommies. It seems like we're in action here, guys. I just need to work out where to park the car. Rain, stay away. Um, and because this is about to be such an exciting event, I think we could well invite some extra people on board, but we're just gonna give it a minute or two. I just wanna get into position before we do that. And again, it's this kind of very, very fine balance uh, in situations like this where we don't want to interfere. That's why I'm kind of doing a massive loop around where the Tommies are. The Tommies are directly to our left now. I'm kind of heading away from them because I don't want to disturb them. Oh, this rain. We're just going to have to take a chance here, everyone, with the rain. Rain will not stop play today. It's just a bit of drizzle. Um, whew, exciting stuff. It's been an action-packed afternoon, and of course, it's wonderful to have you guys on board. Why don't you do us a favor and phone a friend that doesn't watch the fire live and tell them to log in because there is about to be some action. Now, if any of you are getting seasick, I'm sorry. 
It's a bumpy area we're driving through, and there's nothing James can do about that. And I can't drive slowly, otherwise we run the risk of missing the action. So just, I don't know what to say. <laughs> Apologies, though. Righty then. Now these Tommies are stretched so far and wide it's difficult to, for me to decide where to position the vehicle but I'm almost in a spot where we can stop and kind of reassess things so hopefully soon the bumpiness will stop and the action will begin to unfold. Oh, this rain. <laughs> Shannon, you would like to you would like to know if Kenya is the cheetah that climbs onto cars, James. She's at 12 o'clock, uh, just past the wildebeest to the left. There we go. Well done. Um, so no, she doesn't climb on cars, and it's something that we do not promote. Oh, here she goes. Here she goes. I'm going to stay put, everyone. We are very far away, but I just can't run the risk of moving now. And I think we are in a good spot. The Tommies are beginning to run. If you widen up a bit now, James. Keep widening. Huh. All the, all the Tommies have disappeared. Hello everyone, welcome to the Masai Mara. You have joined us sadly at the wrong time. <laughs> this cheetah um, was kind of sneaking up on some Thompson's gazelle, her favorite food at this time of the year, mainly because the small antelope have got youngsters. But it seems like our efforts welcoming you on board failed. So nobody extra jumped on board. So it was just all of you who have been here from the get-go. So I don't really need to explain what happened because you saw it for yourselves. I wonder why she started to run from so far away. Not very clever, Kikenya. Um, anyway, back to the cheetahs jumping on cars. No, she doesn't. Um, that was a cheetah called Malaika, and uh, she is no longer. It's... There's multiple cheetah that do that uh, in Kenya, Tanzania, uh, all over Africa. It's not uncommon for them. Uh, apologies, we did manage to get the action broadcast going. Um, we weren't sure if the actual feed went through. Um, hence me welcoming you and then not being sure if you were on board. But basically we were hoping to show you some action as this cheetah is trying to catch herself a meal. But I guess those are the joys of being on board a live safari. Uh, sometimes you miss the action, sometimes strange things happen. And be sure to keep an eye on the notifications. This lady is hungry. We will try and give you better warning next time and get you to see the chase. See you later. All right, everybody. Sorry about that. There's a little bit of confusement. Um, we're going to stay put. It seems like Kenya certainly is intent on trying to find herself a meal. How much time has she got? She's still got about half an hour or so before it gets dark, and that's not to say she won't catch one after dark. Either way, we're going to stay put and send you back to Steve with the wild dogs that are beginning to get active. Yes, well, just in time, the adults are just getting up and the puppies are one by one getting very excited. Let's have a listen. There's a bit of a greeting ceremony about to take place. And obviously they go quiet as soon as I say that. See how the babies, the pups have got their heads down, their ears flat, their mouths open.
How cool is that? That is them just basically reinforcing all the bonds that they have, all of the dominance behaviors within the Very, very special to be able to see that, folks. Wow. The one female got up and started moving towards the other adults. The same sort of behavior with the head flat, and the ears flat, and the mouth a little bit open. And the puppies mimic that behavior. It's all submissive behavior. It's all sort of bonding. And it's interesting when, they, when they're being aggressive towards a, an individual like Ayahina. They do quite similar, except their mouth isn't open. They drop their ears and they kind of stalk towards it. The puppies are all very excited that things are on the move. The only question is, where are they going to go now? Because um, if they go that way, we're pretty stuck. <laughs> we are um, nose down in a little drainage depression. We have to do some serious reversing to get out of here first. Okay, well, they're starting to settle. This is the decision time. Do we move out and find a better position on the other side? Or do we stay right here? President, that's pretty much both. Um, there's a lot of visual recognition. But in animals, dogs, smell is enormous. Smell is enormous. They obviously, uh, they see a lot. They can see lots and lots of things. I don't know if you've ever shown your dog its own image in a mirror. They go crazy because they don't know who that is. They've never seen that individual before. And so they bite and want to attack it. So they do recognize each other. But smell plays such an important part in the life of a dog. So I would say that a lot of it has got to do with smell. Um, but I've seen lions and, and individuals like that moving towards each other before not knowing who the other one is and then something clicks I don't know if it's a visual cue or if suddenly this smell cue kicks at some point and then everything changes once there's that recognition uh, but the dogs are always together and they, they also recognize each other through call I'm sure and when they lose each other they will call and shout that that high whooping sound that they do and I think they're all quite unique they sound very similar to us but to wild dogs themselves, they sound, obviously, there's a uniqueness to each individual. And so they'll be able to find each other that way. And due to the fact that they're quite spread out throughout Africa, they don't encounter other packs too often. Okay, all the excitement is gone. Back to a lazy afternoon. Well, the puppies have at least come out of the drainage now where there's a little bit of a breeze moving. Down there it was very, very still and humid and sticky and without any breeze. Um, all the adults were sitting up on the bank, keeping nice and cool with the breeze in a bit of shade. I think the puppies have learnt themselves a very important lesson there. No one was going to tell them. They have to learn it themselves. Very cute. Let's quickly go up to the Masai Mara with Scott. Kenya's just got up and started running towards something. I'm not too sure what she's seen. This would be a good time to invite other people on board. Where's she gone? Where has she gone? As you can see, there's lots of Tommies here. Nikki, can you hear me? Tell me if we're going to go live with an action broadcast. I think we should just do it now so we don't run the risk of missing it. Very good, thank you. What did she see? I've got her now. She's a long way off. She is standing. But for her to have just got up and started running like that, she must have seen something. Okay, she's on the move again. Have you got her there, James, at three o'clock? Have you got her, James? Yes or no? Oh. 
Okay, good. Sorry about the bumpiness, guys, but that's what happens when you're not driving along a tar road, I guess. Um, we don't have time to diddle-daddle. Um, where is she now? She was somewhere directly. Yeah, she's coming straight towards us. Um, okay. Well done, James. So, it appears like she's looking at the Tommies that we went past a little bit earlier. But if we look at them, they just at Let's have a quick look at the Tommies, James. They're at our kind of 2 to 3 o'clock. It looks like the Tommies have spotted her. And the reason why we know that the Tommies have spotted her, that's 1 o'clock. Oh, there's another one there. Very good. Those ones are even further ahead. And you can see that they have started running towards her which means she now lacks the elements of surprise but she doesn't need the elements of surprise if there's youngsters she's on the move james she's moving from the right of that termite mound well done oh but the tommies have scattered off it's really tricky <laughs> it's really tricky business trying to show you everything well done james um depending on where our vehicle is parked Let's have a close look back at the cheetah again because there's a warthog running straight towards her and warthogs are known to sometimes give cheetah a hard time. Let's open up a bit and see where the cheetah is. Uh, where'd the cheetah go? She's in shot now. You can tighten up a bit and you'll get both of them. Let's see if this warthog doesn't chase her. I interestingly saw a warthog chase the five musketeers once, which wasn't what I was expecting. You might hear a little bit of pitter-patter as the rain's beginning to fall again. And it seems like we have got our work cut out for us. There's a wall of rain coming towards us from the north. It seems like we've got a bit of a standoff here between the warthog and the cheetah. Oh no, this rain is no good. I'm not sure if you can hear it pitter pattering. Is the warthog going to show the cheetah who is boss? Time will tell. It seems like everything's peaceful for now. I think she's thinking about following these Tommies. She's kind of heading off in the same trajectory. Ooh, what has she spotted now again? Off she goes at high speed. I'm going to swing the vehicle because she's going to disappear out of our view if I don't. Oh, it's one lone Tommy, it looks like, over there. Let's try and keep up with her, James. Just stay on her. Stay on her. So he's just going to stay wide for now, but it's just useful for him to stay on her in the event that I stop the car. He knows where she is. Sorry, it's, I know it's bumpy, guys, but if we don't do this, then we run the risk of missing everything because it'll be very difficult for James to find her if he doesn't know where she is from the get-go. Well, this is very chaotic, but exciting. And I'm sorry if you guys are feeling seasick, but I guess that's the reality of doing these things live. You're here for every step and bump along the way. And as you can see, even though she's not running, we're having trouble working out where she is. Huh. Where have you gone, Kikenya? Okay, she's behind the termite mound at uh, 9 o'clock here, James. You'll just see her head poking out. Very good. Okay, so she's kind of s just sitting still there behind that mound. Um, 
you can't see her, but she's there. Um, so at least we know where she is, and we're gonna try and get into a better spot and send you back to Steve in the meantime. Yes, well, you can probably tell that we've moved our positions. Um, we they started moving. We've come to the other side in anticipation for them to move towards sort of Gallego watering hole. How fantastic it is that Scott has got Kikenia doing her thing. It'll be so exciting to see her catch something this afternoon. Even for us to see these guys catch something. It's a little bit lazy. It's still just a little bit too warm, but I don't think it's far away from them moving. That initial display that they had moments before was uh, the prelude to them starting to get moving. Every time they reconnect with the family, the pack, if some are away, that is what goes on. The youngsters nipping and biting at the ankles of the adults, which only goes so far, because when you bite an adult too hard or a little bit too aggressive, they bite you back had a little bit of a moment of that before and then they end up squealing but it's lessons learnt don't do that and uh, very quickly they learn how to become an adult wild dog and what's accepted and what's not within the society so that they know how to behave not just in this pack but if they head off and to form their own or to to join other wild dogs they at least know their table manners Crafty, that's a great question. I have absolutely no idea. Um, the, the domestic dog is just a basically derivative of the wolf from a very, very long time ago. And wild dogs and wolves were once on the same sort of lineage line. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say no, but I don't think it's happened before. I have absolutely no idea. I wonder if anyone else, else out there knows, or has asked the question before, or had it answered, knows, is it possible for wild dogs to mate with domestic dogs? Or to successfully breed is the right question, I suppose. Um, mating is a different story altogether. Can they actually have puppies? Very good question. There is one of the males. Don't go through the drainage line, sir. We've just come from that side. And here comes the female. She'll be coming up behind him in a moment. There she is. Her mammary glands have reduced. They're not very swollen, you'll see in a moment, which means that there's not so much pressure on her for suckling at the moment. Okay, and off they go. Okay, well, we're gonna see if we can get around and keep up with these. The rest of them are still behind us here, but in the meantime, it seems like Taylor has had some luck with some large bovines. We have, but they're disappearing now into the bushes. It was the beefalo. It, this is just the tail end of the buffalo herd that we've been seeing over the last couple of days. So I'm going to say, what's the time now? It is two minutes after 5 p.m. Central African time. I'm going to say by 25, between 20 and 25 past 5, the buffalo will be at the Voyatella Pan. So keep an eye out. They're on their way. Uh, just unfortunately we don't off-road for buffalo but the entire herd is somewhere in there and Senzo and I have now got the world's population of flies buzzing about us and trying to go into our oh no I might be wrong the zoomie apparently is already on the buffalo shall we go down there then Senzo let's do that because these guys are just taking their time they've got nowhere to be apparently yeah. go away flies get out of my face Oh my goodness, okay. False alarm. False alarm will be there. I thought they were still a little bit further away, but well done to Zoomy. We're ever zooming today on the damn cam. Speed racing. I should probably just change gears. Yeah, over a little bump. Sorry for the pixelation, gremlin breakup, all those types of things. They're rude. They are just playing rude. Yeah, so there's another herd of buffalo, by the way. There's two big herds of buffalo. This one, 
and then apparently I don't know they said Makulu Klambi which means a really big herd down in Buffalo's Hook near the Kruger boundary so I don't know how big that is maybe it's a couple of hundred but it would be quite epic if they come venturing on this way so with all the buffalo around it's it's only a matter of time before the lions come back so that's quite exciting and like I said to you the sticks pride is somewhere on Chitwa so they could pop on we also have access to Torchwood so if they go on to Torchwood we can go and see them and then I don't know where the Inkahuma pride is I heard Abel who's one of the guides out here in the north he said something along the lines of I don't know if I misheard him on the radio last night he had the three evoker male lions which are the new youngsters that have moved into the area as well as five lioness near this herd of buffalo they were just um, near big dam which is in buffalo's hook who are they what lions are those so I don't know where the Inkuhumas are at the moment but we know that there are 11 of them in total so we are getting they should be getting to that time now where they going to come into Estrus soon because those cubs are over two years old now. Well, they're not even cubs. They're sub-adults. They're almost big. Oh, no. I'm being told that the buffalo are going to beat me. Yeah. Pretending there's wild dogs. Steve and I might end up in the same sighting shortly, but let's go back to him and find out if those dogs are heading towards for your telepan. Yes, thanks, Taylor. Well, I hope you do get some marvelous shots of those buffalo coming down to drink. We, um, we're with them just here, the two adults, the female and the male. I probably assume he's possibly the alpha. They came and sat in front of us beautifully in the road over here. And now, as soon as Nikki told me, are we going to come back to you, they decided to go back. So I don't know what they're doing. Hopefully, we'll find out soon enough. Maybe she's just gone to say, oi, all of you, come on. Oh, now they're moving the other way, so maybe that's what's happened. Let's have a look. They're just up ahead of us over here. I think the puppies are all still in the same place. It's a bit bumpy, so hold on, everybody. Okay, so a few people have answered the question that they can't in fact breed with domestic dogs. Thank you for that. Okay, so now this is a problem. They are going in the exact direction we really did not want them to go. Okay, well while we try and get into a better position, it seems like Taylor is in pole position for those buffalo. Almost. They just beat me. I navigated, I tried to drift around the corner, but I couldn't make it in time. So I'm just quickly taking a wide berth around the cam, well, the dam cam, because I want the buffalo to not get a fright. And I also want to get them with a nice golden light on them. So we're just doing a big loop, loop de loop. Ah! Says the hardy dog. Now we're in a good position. Yeah, and I'm going to get comfortable, lay down now. Goodness, it sounds like big trucks all fighting after a car park. Shh, hardy da, this is not your moment to shine. This is the buffalo. Don't steal their thunder. Very inconsiderate, those hardy da's. Can you hear the buffalo, all the sounds that they make? Gizmo. I cannot stand flies. I really dislike them. Um, so you've asked now what, what does a fly taste like? Normally when I have eaten them I just swallow them whole so I don't have to chew them because I don't think they taste very nice. Since have you ever eaten a fly? Mm, not, not on purpose. Yeah. No, no, I don't think anyone eats a fly. I don't think anyone goes, mm, Oh, I feel like a, a bit of garlic and ginger. Oh, yes, and some flies. Flied lice. <laughs> I don't know. Anyways, look at all these buffalo crowding around for your telepad. There's a what? There's a baby one. Oh, goodness, careful. You could get stampeded. It's like what the malls look like. 
happen sometimes on the weekends with everybody fighting over the sale. I'm in there battling it out. Too. I normally try to go to the shops much early so I don't have to fight the crowds though. But it's awesome how they've all just gone into the dam. There's not enough space for them all. Yesterday they were much more civilized at taking turns. It was sort of a wave that was coming in to drink. I just think this is absolutely gorgeous. Now oh, they're not fighting so much, but there's again running out of room here. And the light is also just so gorgeous. John, I think it depends on what predator is trying to take down an animal that would determine, because obviously a leopard would not be able to bring down a fully grown buffalo, but a pride of lions, yes, it is difficult. I mean, they're such tough, hardy animals. Um, so it's up there in, I think, one of the more difficult animals to bring down. I think trying to bring down an elephant would also be quite hard. The same thing goes for a hippo. They're enormous creatures with serious power and they outweigh the predators tenfold, you know, so they do have a good chance of backing out. And then the other thing is, is that hunting an animal that lives in a herd like this, and they're so social with one another, they defend one another often, um, I, I think that's, of course, another factor. So, yeah, so I definitely think that uh, a buffalo would be one of the more difficult animals to take on. This is so cool. It's actually quite therapeutic listening to the sounds. This buffalo doesn't like us very much. MVP, do you want to take a, a gamble at counting? How many buffalo are here? Because I haven't got a clue. I think we've been saying there's not more than 50 here. Maybe between 30 and 50 animals or so. It's, it's a decent size herd. That's for sure. Says one buffalo. I'd also be in the middle. Mama, I don't know where Scoobit is. I think Scoobit would have been taken into the witness protection program. No, I'm joking. You know, it's probably just hiding underneath a log or something somewhere. The adults would have, uh, I think, would have ushered it out and said, you know, right, get out of the way. Because they will. The buffalo won't trample it on purpose. Right, it seems as though Steve Volvo has managed to relocate the wild dogs and it sounds like he's just having an absolute blast. Well, yes, indeed. We are indeed having a blast. They are on the other side where we originally had them this morning and then when we came in, this is the access we came in on. So they've just been sort of just making us work a little bit. All the youngsters came up there. There's a small little branch there that we had to drive over earlier and they were all sniffing where the tire had been and what's this what's this <laughs> I'm sure we've driven in something somewhere along the way and their noses are going I wonder what this is here a mixture of all sorts of things really together with the tire well the temperatures definitely dropped an enormous amount so that's why they're up and active now, even in an area that was completely full of Sun earlier there we go, look at the very brown nose there from smelling all sorts. There we go, smelling the log again. What's that? What is there? What is that? Well, I'd love to know what's going on in the mind when the dog is doing that. Going to come a little bit closer, a little bit daring, this one. <laughs> they are very, very cute. There's little mini versions of the adults. Without the perspective, it's really hard to see that they are so young. But uh, when you see them next to the adult, it's quite obvious. Here comes. He's being a little bit daring, going places where he shouldn't be going. This one's inquisitive. What's going on with you? You're playing over there on your own? Such different behavior to, to cats. I mean, this is the stage when you start seeing uh, lions, lion cubs starting to stalk each other and try to catch each other, where dogs are just inquisitive. You sniffed that or you peed on that. Let me do the same such different behavior and uh, that's why we have cat and dog people in the world I absolutely love having a cat I've never I've never done too well owning a dog I think they're just they're a lot more work I do enjoy dogs 
and I just don't, haven't had the time for a long time to have a dog. But just the behaviours that they both exhibit, cats and dogs, very, very different. Ooh, what's that one doing? He looks like he was about to stalk the one to the right. He was doing a similar sort of, I'm going to stalk you fashion, and then he, he lay down on the ground and started eating a stick. Well, isn't that a dog for you indeed? There we go. I want that stick. There we go. Give me your stick. <laughs> that is such dog behavior. I love it. The differences are great. Cats tackle each other and dogs have to bite each other's faces. Steal each other's sticks. Go. A little bit of play happening. Very good. Very important bonds. There are the adults. You can see the size difference. Their heads are up, they're alert. This is a time of day where lions and leopards could pose a threat if they're moving around, so it's important that the youngsters stay very close. The adults will be listening for any cue, any sort of particular sound that they're quite used to out here that indicates the presence of a lion or a leopard. A leopard would very easily or very willingly take one of these uh, wild dog pups. It's all about competition in the eyes of, of predators. And here, now you can see the size comparison. They're going to come and give us a run by. Here's the alpha female, probably with her alpha male directly behind. How fantastic is that? Directly behind the car they go. And here come the puppies. Da, 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 da. <laughs> and think of a little theme tune. <laughs> I'm so blessed. This is so awesome. <laughs> oh, this is the cutest thing ever. <laughs> Who doesn't like a puppy? Who doesn't like a puppy? Well, I do. Let me. We have managed to park in the perfect place, Viem. Hey, eh? quite impressed. Quite happy with that. The other two adults are on their way. We're going to we're not, obviously not get in their way, but try keep up with the ones in the front. Gonna come right past us. Lindsay, your wild dogs will, will basically use an aardvark burrow, an excavated aardvark burrow uh, that's maybe been used before by porcupine, honey badger, hyena, uh, but generally in termite mines or a hole in the ground that's been excavated by, by an aardvark in general. Uh, warthogs will use it, but they can dig to a degree as well to get in there but they don't make the entire burrow themselves. I haven't heard of them making the entire one. They'll generally use something that's there already and just modify it slightly. Okay, well here they are, just up ahead of us. And they're gonna go right, are they? Just a little bit awkward on the little ground here. Yes, they're gonna go right, so let me turn around onto the road. Sorry, Vip. Pop around on here. And they've decided they want to go north. Oh, they're looking west. Here we go. There's a family of wild dogs for you. Rocker, that's a great question. Um, I'm not sure about um, whether an, an individual would challenge to become the alpha. I mean, it's very likely that that sort of behavior would happen. I mean, I'm no wild dog expert. It's definitely something that's quite new, sort of in my horizon of education. But it's something I'm going to look up for sure. But generally what happens is maybe if you get a little bit boisterous uh, youngster, they might move off instead rather than uh, dominating their, their parent. But someone has to fill the shoes of the adult at some stage. So I, I'm sure that they will take the place of the adult if the time arises. But I've never known of too much sort of aggression within within the family. The alphas are basically just the be all and end all of the of the family. And if you're not happy with it, you move off to, to, another, to another family, another pack. But maybe someone out there Oh, look at all these tracks on the road. Just so cute. All the little tracks. <laughs> Lots of wild dog tracks there. There they go. <laughs> Hippo, they're pretty similar in size to the dog. I'd say, you know, no German Shepherd. They're smaller than a Labrador. Sort of between a... Yeah, they're about the size of a, of a smallish Border Collie. Sort of a... 
Yeah, not a big border collie. A border collie is sort of size, and a lot of their behaviour sort of kind of looks like that as well. That, that eagerness, that busyness. But yeah, you know, I'd say the, the adults are somewhere in the region of a, of a border collie size. There they go. They're all busy. They sniffed a little patch on the ground there that maybe was something from last night. We found them just on the right here this morning. We had some tracks in the road, so it's very possible uh, that there was some scent marking done or some defecation done there, and they're all very keen to smell it. And that's one of the reasons why uh, diseases transmitted for dogs are very easily transmitted, because they're very keen to sniff. They'll put their nose into anything. They don't know that it's bad for them, and unfortunately, if there's a disease, well, they will contract it, because that's generally where most diseases are contracted, is through the nose, through the mouth, through the saliva, you see the characteristic little white tails and there's the, <laughs> the guardian keeping up the back there making sure no one's sneaking up on these little puppies like a vehicle from wild earth okay well we're going to see if we can keep up with them but the route they're heading is heading to go they're getting bivvles shortly unless they find something interesting but while we keep up with them we're going to be flying all the way back up to another very special cat Kenya and Scott. Well I hope they change direction Steve and come running straight back towards you. Kikenya is still scanning around in the hope that she can get a snack and she's just yawned a couple of times so maybe she's gonna get up and go for one more stroll but it seems like most of the Tommies that were in this area a little bit earlier have all disappeared. I've been scanning with my binoculars and can't seem to see any in the immediate vicinity but what I do know is that you can be very quickly surprised so we must be ready for anything she is definitely definitely quite hungry now if she doesn't get lucky this evening she will in all likelihood be even more motivated first thing tomorrow morning oh here she goes and that's good prospects I think both David and Brent will be out in the morning and you'll also possibly be meeting a new interviewee tomorrow a guy called Steve another Kenyan so that's exciting stuff. He might do one or two segments tomorrow. I'm not too sure on the finer details. So um, I think that's what the plan is. Um, so yeah, you can look forward to meeting somebody new tomorrow as he goes about his interview. And I'm definitely going to tell the guys to come and have a look here, whether it's David or Brent or both that decide to come and search for her. I definitely think there's good prospects with this lady. very very good thankfully the weather's held out for us there were a few brief showers of rain but nothing too hectic why is she slinking have you spotted some tommies down there hello peter you would like to know what does kikenya mean and it means early morning i don't think it means early morning in swahili Maybe it does. Maybe it's in Ma, the local language. The Maasai people speak here. Uh, she is, I think, sniffing around looking for any youngsters because I can't see any Tommies in the direction she's heading. But she seems to have a certain slink about her. Okay, very good. We need to rush you back to Steve. He has caught up with the wild dogs again. Enjoy. Yes, we have. Thank you very much. We are with them, and this might be our final glimpse. We are right on the northern fire break. Um, Buffelsook is just to our right-hand side. The youngsters have all stopped. I don't know exactly what they're picking up there. They're all munching. Some bone or some dung, I don't really know. Oh, it looks like some bone. Like a tortoise shell. A little bit of calcium. Taking their, their, their tablets for the day. Growing puppies need to make sure they get enough bone in them. Enough calcium to ensure that they get strong bones. 
beautiful visuals there. There's two adults with the sun in the distance. It's quite sort of an eerie sky. Seems to be a fire coming from the north somewhere. We can't really see it, but Rexon was on the radio with me earlier asking if I had seen any smoke, but we can't see any smoke. Days like this when it's very, very windy and lots and lots of heat, very hot, fires can get out of control. That's the reason why we've burnt these fire breaks over here so that we can be protected if a fire does happen to come into us from the north well it hits this 50 60 meter gap burn across them because on, on a hot windy day like this impossible to try and fight a fire it's very dangerous just and that is where fire is to burn in the africa to burn in the africa okay well we seem to be losing a little bit of signal which is a pity uh, we're still with the dogs here. They're running per par parallel with um, our northern boundary. I'm just going to go very slowly here and see if we can come up with them. Seems like the signal is back to us. Come on, gremlins, bear with us, please. Now, this is where we were this morning when we got a steenbok. Uh, find lots of steenbok in these open areas. Just, I suppose, it's because it's easier to see them. But um, they had already snacked on a steenbok when we found them. We had them with the steenbok's head. The youngsters were, were playing with it. I don't think the steenbok enjoyed the games very much. Hello, Shut. You want to know if the wild dog involved in the hunt? No, not at all. passengers along the way. And as soon as I space the adult and do exactly what it is face the animal to the ground the for a short period terribly sorry about the dead zone with regards to signal. I don't think you're hearing me very clearly. Watch them depart in the distance with the sun setting in the distance. Okay, well, let's go over to Taylor. This is what Steve looked like when he was in slow-mo now. <laughs> I don't know why I was joking, like I was a praying mantis. Anyways, I'm moving far away from those buffalo. I'm not having anything to do with them because I almost said a very bad word on the dam cam as five different biting flies bit me at the same time and then promptly realized where I was sitting. So you may have heard me shout ow at some point. And then Senzo and I raced away. You will not believe how many flies came with that big herd of buffalo it was it, it is insane so yeah so I'm, I'm not going back there we can go this way let's try to see if we can find tandy who asked that question sorry i missed the beginning Sorry, well, just finished your carry on um, from where Steve was sort of started with wild dogs and the puppies um, hunting and whether they participate in the hunt. At that age, no, they're way too young still. So they might try and keep up with the adults at some point still, because I've seen them running with the adults when the adults have been off for a hunt and then have come back. Remember, like the other afternoon when we first saw them just on the boundary and um, they were trying to keep up with the adults, but um, they are also left by themselves so when they get a bit older and probably find closer to about eight months nine months a year somewhere around there then yes they might actively be a part of it whether they're actually bringing down the animal I highly doubt it but that doesn't matter just being there um, is good for for experience but right now you know they're lucky the adults bring them true toys back for instance like a Dacre or a Steenbok head that's their favorite thing to do and then they all play with it and they tear on it um, but, but soon they'll be there when the adults make a kill and then start devouring with. I can't believe it. it's, it's amazing though. It just goes to show how lucky we are that it has taken Steve, I mean, well over, well over 10 years 
um, to see uh, wild dog puppies. Don't you think that's pretty spectacular? I think so. I think it is awesome. And because they're so young as well, they're so cute. Perfect timing. Because I can hear a Franklin alarming. So I'm going to figure out what on earth this petrified Franklin is shouting at. Off you go to, well, another predator that's probably going to cause a bit of stir with the animals in the Mara. Mm, exciting stuff. I hope the petrified Franklin is petrified of Hosanna. I know Taylor was looking for earlier. I think we are going to say good night and good luck to Kenya. The light is beginning to fade and there's no immediate prey in the area. Although, what's going on with what's going on with this body language? Um, and I want to leave her in peace after dark and go off in search of some long lost friends, the Owino Pride. For those of you who don't know the Owino Pride, it consists of two adult lioness and three youngsters that were born probably a year and four, five months ago, year and a half ago, by now, roughly. Interestingly, though, the last time that they were seen, two of the youngsters were missing. The boy and the one girl. So, I'm hoping that they were just temporarily kind of away from the adults and their other sibling, possibly snacking on a wildebeest. But that was the last time they were seen, so it'll be nice to try and catch up with them. It's incredible, unless... You know, we spend huge amounts of hours and kind of tag team staying with the animals, one of us at night, one of, you know, and then one of us during the day. We can lose track of them in this massive wilderness and then not see them for weeks. Um, there's also massive areas of the park that are not really explored as much as others and that is applicable to the Owino Prides territory. There's not many roads there and the roads that are there are bumpy um, and it's far away from the river, which kind of steals the show at this time of the year. So I want to swing past that area. Having said that, though, it's not going to be easy leaving this lady on the move. Just going to scan ahead and must make sure that there's no Tommies in the direction she's heading. But what a beautiful scene this is with all the wildebeest in the background. Absolutely awesome. So it may be your last view of Kikenya. Everybody say goodbye. And the next time you see us, we will probably be searching for lions. Well, thank you, Scott. That sounds like a magical scene. We only have one wildebeest here, and he's on the back with a camera at the moment. No cheetah. Well, we do have the wild dogs. So we're up at Sydney's Dam. We're looking at them from a far distance because they're north of us on the Bivelswick property. And there's a little concrete pan there which is probably generally pumped, um, but today it doesn't seem to have a lot of water in it. Very similar to the, the pan that the buffalo are at, except this one doesn't seem to be working. The, you can hear the pups whelping, yelping from here. They're trying to, to get in, but it's probably quite deep. Or they don't want to fall inside, although I'm sure they could get out again if they just took the plunge. Hello, Christine. I'm not sure about the sexes of the pups at the moment. I only was able to identify one this morning, uh, this afternoon, um, and one was a female. The other five, I don't quite know yet. But anyway, these wild dogs are showing interest in something towards us. I think we might just give it another moment. There is some thick bush to the left of us there. And that little segment there with some lots of game paths going through, which uh, obviously facilitate that watering hole there. And perfect little area for, for Dacre, a steenbook or two. Anything could be hiding in there, lying up in wait.
Well, well, wildebeest. How did you spot that? Well, VM has spotted a Daker. I think it's a Daker. Very, very good. It's very far away, so any movement, even me breathing on the car, makes the camera move. See how far away that is? I wonder if that wild dog has spotted that Daker. Daker isn't looking back in that direction. Daker wouldn't be the hardest animal to catch for a wild dog. They're, they're quite nippy over a short distance, but they really don't have the stamina. Their objective is to stand very still and to remain undetected. That is the primary focus of being in the thickets, using the, the terrain to your advantage. The two adults aren't as interested. And the one really just wants to have a drink, I think. The youngsters are quite thirsty. It's been a very hot day. Hottest of the season so far, I think. And it's only going to get warmer. And Jennifer, me too. I also haven't actually seen it happen. I've, I've seen them with the remains of a kill. I've never actually seen it go down uh, live anyway. I've seen video footage of it. So maybe today is the day. In this open landscape that we have here, with this beautiful camera that we have, we could almost be in the Masai Mara with the lack of trees in this view. So if something went down in this open area, I think wildebeest would be able to capture it. Well, let's not jinx it now. Possible. That female is still... I think it was the female. Still hasn't materialized back from the bushes there. The other adult has lost interest and is now moving back. I'm trying to scan the bushes there with my binoculars, but I can't quite see her. Could this be the day that we... Many of us who haven't seen a wild dog kill, could this be the day that it happens? It always amazes me when you do see wild dog how there is almost no animals around. They don't even alarm call when they see wild dog, they just leg it. They just make it for the thickets, and escape, get out of the view of the wild dog without making any sound so as to attract attention towards themselves. Well, anyway, we're going to stay right here with these dogs. Hopefully they come back onto Druma. Uh, that would be marvellous. But in the meantime, let's go over to Taylor McCurdy, who's driving. Let's see what she's up to. Nothing. We've got nothing yet. So we obviously had that Franklin alarming and then a go-away bird let out a like it was unhappy about something but nothing much materialized from that so i thought let's just drive to Bifflesook dam let's have a look because if tundi is somewhere in this block the closest water for her will be at um will, will most certainly be at Bifflesook dam so maybe it's her moving around maybe she's on her way to have a drink so i'm hoping that as we arrive there we see a leopard or a pride of lions. I just don't want to see any more buffalo because I don't want to be bitten by any more flies. Whew, it's so painful. Although Senzor has been also bitten actually more than me today. Normally it's me that gets attacked, but the tables have turned. They like him today. Okay. Hoi, we're almost there, just around the corner. Maybe Winston will be here. Maybe Aretha and Benjamin Franklin will also be here. Who knows? I don't know why I always do this like I'm like trying to look around a corner when I approach a dam. It's the most bizarre thing. I'm surely you've seen me do it before. We're almost there and I'm like trying to see it before all of you. <laughs> oh, hang on. What was that footprint? No, hyena. Very big hyena. Sorry, I got excited. Mina Moo, I think animals can get heat stroke. Um, I mean, like when we dart rhinos and things like that, 
you constantly and elephants and I suppose any of the animals you're constantly pouring water over them to keep them cool um, and I know I've known a few animals that have died from complications and some I've had two different occasions where the vet has said that it was from um, the heat you know it overheated so I suppose it does happen uh, but I, I mean I think while they're up and around it's okay they can do many different things to try and cool themselves down hi Steve scuba Steve is here he wasn't here this morning I don't know where he was but he's come back but there he sits very happy with life as you can see most unimpressed hippo ever Oh no, is it that time of the year again? This is like James's best time of the year. Remember last year, didn't we wear eye patches for Talk Like a Pirate Day? Thanks, Shannon. Thank you so much for this. I really can't talk like a pirate. Senzo, can you talk like a pirate? Mm -hmm. You don't even want to try. I need to rehearse first. You need to rehearse. Yeah. Well, go on, practice. <coughs> that, Senzo, that's what he's doing now. I think you should come sit here and everyone can oh, see you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come, let's see. Come, Senzo, please zoom out. Let's let's see you. We miss you. The viewers love to see you. Uh, Senzo's waving his finger at me. He's going, uh uh. Uh 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 uh. No, sister. Is basically what he's just done to me. Um, <laughs> Uh, my favourite actually is putting Craig on camera because he dis he despises it so much. He's so unimpressed by it. <laughs> it's my best. Uh, there's my guilty pleasure. I don't know how to do a pirate thing. Arg me hearty. Uh, that's me done. I'm, I'm normally really good at participating, but I cannot participate in this day, unfortunately. I'm really hopeless. Uh, however, Steve has got a nice gruff voice. Perhaps he'll be able to do it. If James is here... Didn't James do an incredible pirate voice once for a Halloween, for maybe like two years ago, Halloween? I don't know. That, the time that I painted all sorts of faces. <laughs> oh, those are the days. How I've grown since then. Steve, do you remember that? Did you just say that was the worst sighting that you've ever had in the, in the Sabi Sand? Yeah, I see. He sends all the give the fans what they want. Give the fans what they want. Our Lara Moore is now chanting. Just try. I don't know how to do a lot of things, but I also just try. Oh, you see, yes. Come on, Senzo. Just try. I promise I won't be harsh on you. Just once. He's got stage fright now. I don't think Senzo will do it. <sighs> Hashtag not a team player. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm only joking. <laughs> of course, I'm just teasing him. Senzo is most certainly a team player. Uh, it's just because I didn't know. Oh, scrub hair. Is that a scrub hair at the edge of the dam? Like 12 o'clock, I saw something running. Hello. You're up early. No, oh, I suppose it's not up early. They are crepuscular animals so it is that sort of crepuscular time though where the sun is set behind the horizon and the last of the light is slowly fading what have you found there nibbling on something maybe it's eating its own poop oh digging how exciting maybe there's a sprout with grass very quiet out here yeah Greenback Camaroptera, though, which is a little bird. Constance King, yes, you're quite right. Scuba Steve is responsible, not, no, I'm joking, not Scuba Steve, but hippos in general um, do kill more people than the entire Big Five put together. So between lions, leopards, elephants, rhino and buffalo, um, hippos are most responsible. And, and that's just because... You must remember that with all the massive rivers that run throughout Africa, hippos still live there. And there are a lot of villages and informal settlements and things on the edge of the rivers, as, as you can imagine. People make their farms, it's easy to get water, um, and then also for washing your pots and pans and clothing and just bathing in, in the river. So they take a big gamble. And they know the risks. People know the risks when entering the water. Um, so not just being killed in the water, but then also out on land. We were talking about it with a school driver a bit earlier. 
about how hippos come out. Obviously, we, most of us know that they come out to eat grass in the evenings on the cooler periods. And uh, if you get in their way, uh, they're not particularly fond of that. And they tend to react in a negative way most of the time. You can't blame them, though. They don't feel particularly comfortable out on land. So, um, you know, it might, it might just be them bulldozing over. I mean, there was an incident where some people recently were taken out in Kenya by a hippo. But that's, of course... Please don't try and walk towards the water's edge to do, take a selfie or anything like that. Like, just keep away from these wild animals. Even keep away from an impala. Um, an Egyptian goose, I reckon, if you walked up to its nest, it's probably going to fly down and peck you. So essentially all these animals pose a threat to, to humans. We're quite hopeless in that respect in terms of defending ourselves. We don't have thick skin. We don't have sharp claws. Our teeth are blunt. You know, we can't run very fast. Some of us can run faster than others. But just in general, you know, we haven't got great defenses. I mean, look how easily I complained when the flies were biting me. Can you imagine a buffalo that has just got hundreds or thousands of flies covering its body every single day? It doesn't complain. It just swishes its tail and shakes its head every now and then. But crazy. Wonderful. Okay, let's carry on because Senzo and I want to go down in Yala Road North now and hope that we'll find a leopard. I hope um, Steve has some luck trying to find Hosanna. Right. Bye, Steve. What? How did we miss dwarf mongoose? I didn't see the dwarf mongoose. Oh, well. Well done for spotting it. I'm not very vigilant, but you know that. Hold on to my camera equipment so it doesn't fall down. Yeah. See, I'm terrible. This should live ah, in its box. Just in case. So I'm going to check carefully now as we go down here. And I'm also going to do some stopping and listening. I don't know what I just put in my face. Um, we're going to stop and listen quite a bit just to see if we can hear any... Um, Things, any birds, any squirrels, anything, any mammals alarming. That uh, banded mongoose from this morning must be so happy. I can't imagine the stories it's telling the rest of its friends how, oh my goodness, you won't believe what happened to me today, Bob. I was just, I was just out on, you know, I was waking up from Termite Mound and the next minute I opened my eyes and wow, ah, there's a leopard. And then it tried to grab me and all my friends managed to get away and they just left me. None of them had my back. I reckon that's what this mongoose is saying and he speaks that fast as well and then he just they just pinned me in and I shouted I hey hey you leave me alone <laughs> hey <laughs> get away leopard and then it worked I chased the leopard away I haven't I probably <laughs> that's exactly what that mongoose did now he's going to go to the bar later and he's going to go to all the ladies and you'll have like one tiny little scratch on him and be like hey girls uh, yeah check uh, check that hey so, it's from a leopard. I saw this morning, I fought it off. I've still got some of its fluff. Oh, I don't know, because Osana did get stuck in a thorn tree at one point. So, you know, you could have just grabbed that. So, yeah, that was really, it was quite entertaining to watch. I've never heard a mongoose make that sound. If a mongoose did that to me, I'd be like, cool, buddy, whatever. You, you know, you just go. And that's, if anyone, any animal ever tried to attack me, I think that would be me. <laughs> Shouting and screaming. Oh, <gasps> an owl. Oh, wow. An owl. Hello, Rose Eagle Owl. Thank you very much. You're an absolute saving grace because I was telling a really bad story about a mongoose and a leopard. So thank you for joining us. Beautiful. Not too many birds making a noise either as it flew on past. I thought there would have been maybe the odd drongo in hot pursuit after it, trying to bop it on the head. But you were lucky today. That scrub here at Biffles Hook Dam, better be very careful. Oh, I can hear the squirrel alarming. <laughs> Chris, you said I can't speak pirate, but I do a great mongoose. Thank you very much. I try. I try practice my inner mongoose every single day in front of the mirror for 10 minutes. What are you looking for, Al? Scanning around at the moment, and it's sort of been fixated off to the east. I wonder what it has seen. I mean, this is the time for the scrub hairs and things to come out. Guinea fowl and Franklins and spur fowls will all be looking for a place to roost for the evening. 
So perhaps it has seen something. But I'm, I'm starting to hear the odd bird sort of chit and chatter. And then also those squirrels that were not so happy. We've been very lucky. I think I've pretty much seen an owl on almost every single game drive for the last few game drives, which has been pretty epic. It used to be Byron that had all the luck when it came to finding the owls. And now there are either pearl-spotted owlets or fork-tailed drongos mimicking the pearl-spotted owlets. That's quite far away. Actually, I think we arrived in this area at the right time for the last of the birdie calls. Okie dokie. Mrs. Pokey, let's go to Steve and uh, see if he can do a good pirate impression. <laughs> I don't know where that came from, Taylor. If I can be a pirate. Well, I think I did a good job there. Uh, anyway, uh, we moved away from the dogs, or should I say, they ran across the dam wall and went towards the west. Talk like a pirate day. Sharon, I might need to have a few apple juices to talk like a pirate. Arr. What is a what is a pirate's favorite letter? It be the sea. <laughs> Uh, I'm turning into my dad. I laugh at my own jokes. But anyway, we moved on from the wild dogs. They suddenly got very mobile and went into Manileti. So we don't know what happened. We lost a visual of them. Well, that's okay. We had a fantastic afternoon with wild dogs. We're very blessed. But Taylor talk about owls is very interesting. Um, owls are such a special, special group of birds. They're nocturnal. They feed almost, well, most of them primarily on rodents and sort of the bringers of plague and pestilence. And uh, there's huge uh, movements in South Africa, Johannesburg and areas. We've got, um, in, in the old days, there were townships developed in and around the big cities in South Africa for, for the workers to live in and their families moved in. And those, those sort of townships still exist. Lots of people living there, uh, lots of rodents. And a lot of the cultural people in South Africa have got a really, really difficult time dealing with owls. If they see an owl, they want to kill it because they think the owl is the bringer of death. It's their ancestors looking at them coming to say hello or to say it is your time so they honestly have a serious fear of it and you need to respect that so there's a lot of education going on in the communities and in these areas with high abundance of people to try and reintroduce owls to put owl boxes in so the owls can live there naturally because we know that they er eradicate rodents they eradicate the bringers of disease and pestilence and it's important. So there's some really interesting projects going on around the country, all quite individual. I don't have any names off the top of my head, but people trying to just educate and, and bring these owls into the community to realize, but it's a hard one. How do you cross someone's cultural line of honest belief? They think this is the bringer of death, and now we must live in harmony with this. It's, very, it's a very tricky one very very tricky one that can only be dealt with through education and possibly through shows like this one uh, through people actually visiting uh, sanctuaries or or sanctuaries bringing owls to the communities getting the children to hold them because as you know the children are the the next generation and the future maybe some of us old goats are too old to teach new tricks so you need to change the perception of the youngsters those little ones and I think that's why the school drives we do I know a lot of them are international are so important and we need to start harnessing more locally so we can get lots of locals from the local areas in South Africa who are going to make the change interested in those sort of topics. Synergy, interesting. The, the Native Americans believe the owl is the bringer of death, but I don't think they kill the owl if they see it. I think the Native Americans, they respect the owl, they take it as a sign. Um, and that, that I think is what also happens in South Africa, is they take it as a sign, but they don't want that sign, so they kill it. So that's where the kind of the the mixture of the culture and the sign is also there also the, the, the a lot of the cultures in these in these communities are quite mixed and and quite all over the place and they might have lost a little bit of the true essence of of what they would have been like if they were living in the communities with their proper elders but now you've got all of the tribes of south africa living together people from zimbabwe malawi living together working in the cities very energized places and well, we need to get owls into those areas because we need to manage the pests. 
So it's a slow process, but hopefully one day it will be a success, as a lot of the other conservation projects around the country have been. Because you know, wherever people live and where people accumulate, there's waste. And what does waste generate? Well, generates disease through the form of rodents, who are just the transmitters of it. They're not really the bad guys. They just transmit what the filth that we create. The plague, I think, was uh, transmitted initially by, or transmitted by, by rodents. And they've followed us all over the all over the world. Cats and rodents are everywhere because of our ships. We got them on the ships and then we brought the cats to get rid of the rodents. And due to that, we have eliminated enormous amounts of bird populations throughout the world. I do love cats, but feral cats are a serious problem on an island where birds have never ever in their life encountered a predator and a cat even if you've just got your normal domestic cat back home they are incredible hunters of birds and if you've never seen something like that before can you imagine what it must be like basically goes back to the time when humans moved to some of the bigger continents in the world over the glaciers hunting packs of hominids and all those large herbivores and carnivores especially disappeared very very quickly Indeed. Ah, oh. Catherine, Catherine Chipkins, you must please will you send through that that link for us to onto Safari Lava on the YouTube stream? Hopefully, someone can capture it there. Um, but that would be wonderful. She says that they've got a, an owl cam which people can watch the, the owls obviously on their nests and the hatching and, and that's a great way to educate people as well because you can just see while looking at the camera you can see it's just an animal doing its thing you know they have a poo and they feed the chicks and it's really there's nothing there's nothing crazy about it but there's that there's that line that we need to respect culturally culturally but I think that's awesome. I know there's quite a, fit, a lot of research in South Africa on grass owls, and they've got cameras in those, but I don't know if those are accessible to the public. But anyway, we're going to go all the way up to the rainy Masai Mara, Scotty D. Hopefully he's keeping nice and dry. Let's go and see what his plans are. Interesting stuff, Steve. And as you can see, we've had to close up our mobile office due to precipitation the rain and which is a pity it's not too bad now but there's still enough to make us get wet it was a bit stronger earlier and I'm told it's talk like a pirate day Arr! me and James me matey over here are looking for treasure I had to turn my lights down. <coughs> it hurt my throat. <laughs> Sorry, I took it a bit bit seriously, and it made my my throat a little bit ticklish. Um, just letting that guy go past. I don't have any dim lights. I've only got a super bright head beam on. A super bright head beam. I don't know if that even sounds like a pirate. It's somewhat Scottish. Anyway, I'm happy you've been having fun with Stephen and Taylor, pretending that you're pirates. Um, IR lights just shaking a bit loose there, so I just leant back to get it out of the frame. Um, the bumpy roads will do that, and probably not the best driving. It's interesting, I mean, I consider myself a decent driver, but I'm told that I'm not. I think I just drive too quickly. Brent always warns people. Um, Captain Winkle, yes, I, I think it is fair to say that I am a little bit of an embarrassed pirate. Um, it would have been nice to have watched uh, Johnny Depp doing his thing. He's a very clever pirate. Oh, an Irish, an Irish pirate, yes. Um, that's what I was going for. I'm told the Irish made the best pirates back in the day when pirates used to do their thing. <laughs> um, yes, um, Johnny Depp, very good pirates, better than me. I'm not sure how well Taylor and Steve fared. Um, 
Very good. So yes, as I was saying, Brent likes to warn people before they get on a car with me and tell them that I'm a terrible driver, which I guess there could be some truth to. So yes, guys, as I said, um, it would be nice to know who did the best pirate impression. Sadly, I didn't get to see Steve or Taylor's performance, so I will not be able to cast a vote, and I guess it wouldn't be fair for me to be voting considering I'm part of the competition. Um, so yes, let us know who your best pirate is of the day. The Pirate of the Day award goes to Steve or Taylor or the Irish Pirate Scott. Let us know. It would be wonderful to hear who came out on top. Uh, I was really hoping on trying to find you guys a, a glimpse of the Owino Pride, but this weather is just not conducive to searching for animals. And Monique, thank you for getting back to us so quickly and for voting for me, you good thing, Monique. Good choice. Um, <laughs> Louise, uh, who's giving Nix a hand as D2, director number two um, in the FC today, is going to start uh, doing the maths. Wherever Louise goes, she carries an abacus, so she's the perfect person for the job. Um, and soon we will know who the best pirate was. I think James would probably, I've got a feeling James would be a really good pirate. Um, he's generally quite a good actor, probably the best out of all of us. Very good. We shall send you back to Taylor, who like me is just driving about in the hope of finding something. Two pirate is how it should have ended. Um, I don't think I should be a part of that poll because I, that was the first time in my life that I gave I think about minus 25% effort in doing something. Normally I'd, I always give my best. Um, so we will, I don't know. I don't know how to do it, but I have to watch a YouTube tutorial. Do you guys remember that one afternoon safari where uh, Darby and I did Australian accents for pretty much the entire game drive? Well, no, it was about an hour, but it felt like the entire game drive. Oh, that was hilarious. We even watched a YouTube tutorial on how to talk like an Australian. That was so great. But um, I'm pretty sure that there will be some kind of tutor tutorial on talk like a pirate. But uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to. I don't want to be peer pressured into this. I'm not. I'm going to say no peer pressure from the rest of the team. <laughs> of course, I'm just joking. You know, they it's, um, I'm only just joking, but also you can say no to peer pressure for all the young people out there. You don't have to do what's cool. I don't know why I went so serious there, but anyways, you know. <laughs> okay, let's find some animals. Let's <laughs> see what we can find. I think we... Senzo and I... I don't know why I made that sound. Senzo and I are deciding whether we go into the Muluati or not. Do we want to do it? Okay. Central says yes. Yes, please. So we will go there. Oh, is that a monkey? A silhouetted monkey. Right, let's still get it here. Sorry, it has slammed on brakes pretty hard because I would like the tail that's dangling. That's my favorite part. Gorgeous. That is a vervet monkey in the tree eating, I think, maybe some knob thorn flowers. I don't know how nice a knob thorn flower would be. It would be like eating, eating a few pieces of cotton wool, in my opinion. Ugh. Sis, why don't you go into a burr bean tree? They've got nice flowers at the moment. I don't know if it's going to roost up top there, although it's very vulnerable. There's not a lot of leaves to hide it away. It's just sitting there. That's quite cool. They're very pretty. Okay, we'll leave the monkey. It's not alarming. It's not pointing us to anything. But I thought it was an owl at first. Another one. Or two for rose eagle owls in one day? Preposterous. Could never happen. 
But maybe because I said that it would. Just check all the trees. What? Pardon? Excuse me? Brian? Have you all, have you booked your appointment to the to the optometrist? Did you just say am I leaving to be a model? Goodness gracious. I think I've got more chance of becoming a comedian than being a model, but thank you very much. That's very kind. But go and get your eyes checked out, like seriously. Like are you, I hope you're not driving around. Wait, no wait, Nikki says I must flick my hair. Well, I was gonna pull it out and do one of those. No. Oh I washed it today. Sensor's going to no. Because you didn't want to do anything that I asked you, so mm. No no no. No, I don't have the long... Remember that time my ponytail was like down here where my hand is? Now it's so short, I cut all my hair off on my holiday. New year, new me. Um, I need a spotlight, where is it? Okay. Oh, what's that? I don't think it's anything. It just looks like maybe a hyena sitting under a tree. It's probably a Logosaurus. Don't worry, Brian, I'll have to come to that optometrist appointment with you. Oh, now I'm just driving through my own dust. That's great. Well done, Taylor. You're a clever girl. <laughs> Didn't think that one through, that's for sure. Okay, what are we going to find now? I don't know what I'm looking for here. I suppose I could see bush babies. Be a good spot. More owls. Janets. Maybe civets. Horny bedges. Ah, apparently Steve is playing not only a game of talk like a pirate but also copycat. He's got his spotlight out. He's driving around in the dark. Do you want to get a wig too and have blonde hair? No, I'm just joking. Let's go across to him. <laughs> We love her, we do. We don't quite understand her sometimes, but we do love her. Taylor. Yes, indeed, we are playing copycat. That was the whole objective of me getting my, to, my spotlight out. Was to, um, to, so that when you cut to me, it was gonna look exactly the same. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, we're looking for animals at night. We've come towards the west in hopes of maybe catching a glimpse of the ever elusive Hukumuri, or maybe the Duchess Shadulu, wherever she might be at the moment. Is she denning with cubs somewhere that we don't know about? Or where is the reigning Duke of Juma? We're going to make our way towards um, Treehouse Dam now and see what is hanging around there. But before we do that, we have got a roadblock of some kudu just on the left hand side. The IR light is on because the light is very, very low. And it's a good time of day for animals to be moving around. It's still bright enough to see, but the coolness is so to see, but the coolness is so much more than earlier. And look at that. That's exactly what I was talking about about the Daker. The Daker, if they see wild dog, or most animals that see wild dog, they just go and stand behind a bush and just disappear. That is the whole objective of having beautiful contrasting coloration and very slow movements. That one thinks we can't see it. Alas, we can, young female, we can, young lady. The kudu are looking in, in actually pretty decent condition for this time of year, considering we're at the end of the dry season. Normally, if it's been very dry year, um, the kudu are looking very, very poor. The hips, the back of their hips are standing out. The, the rump is going all the way in, sort of underneath the tail. And the mange, often they get a lot of mange on the neck. That one just had a little bit of mange on the neck. But other than that, for the end of for the middle of September, they're looking pretty okay. Pretty okay. What do you think, Viam? Mm -hmm. oh, they're looking good. I've seen kudu in much worse condition than this. So we did have that late rain, which I think did quite well for the vegetation. And uh, the kudu obviously managed to do quite well with the leaves that are still available. Keeping explicitly to the drainage depressions, where the trees are growing at their best with lots of moisture. Just sneak through this other little kudu over here. Hello, young sir. 
Oh, he just wants to be on the camera, V. There he is. A little youngster. Just over a year. They are very accommodating. I wonder if they can talk like a pirate. He look at me going, what? That's the thing. Why is it that whenever we talk about pirates, do they have some form of weird UK accent? Is it just because of the movies? This like weird Irish, like Scottish accent. <laughs> Scott, Scott has an Irish accent. It is. We all seem to think that to be a pirate, we have to talk like a... And it's just from the movies, I suppose. And the pirates back in the day did were made up of, you know, back in the day, you know, of the... Of, of, all, of Captain John, whatever, Long John Sparrow and all those interesting people. They all basically originated from parts of the UK and the reason they were pirates is because they were just illegal. They did things on their own and uh, they didn't pay their taxes and maybe they stole a loaf of bread and next thing they were sent off to a colony to work and, well, no, it's easier life out there. Very interesting time in history to have lived, I reckon. Caribbean was a very interesting place back in those days. Never too late. Do you want to know the difference between a kudu and a nyala? Well, it's quite easy. Um, first of all, a nyala is a lot smaller than a kudu. So the kudu is a lot bigger. I mean, obviously, if you find a group of nyala together, they're not very big. They're almost the same size as an impala, and they've got a similar sort of color as the impala. They've got that sort of brownish coloration to them with white stripes on the body. The kudu, on the other hand, is a lot bigger, and it's actually gray in color. Gray, not that sort of orangey brown, not that rusty brown, completely gray. And uh, they're a lot bigger, and the stripes also aren't as, as well painted. They almost look like they faded a bit. And obviously the, the male kudu look just like the female but they got the big spiral horns whereas the male nyala has got semi spiral horns and he's a chocolate brown color with very long orange socks I hope that answers it for you it is a it is one of those tricky ones but if you see the two together very very easy to to identify just remember impala size sort of the orangey color of an impala but with the stripes on it is a nyala and the kudu much much bigger second biggest antelope we have here in the Kruger National Park in fact so enormous in size can get up to almost 200 kilograms female kudu whereas uh, a male nyala only gets just about 110 kilograms so double that for the pounds or 200 220 pounds for the male and the female kudu almost 400 pounds maybe a bit less maybe maybe 350 60 okay well talking with my hands there Get the spotlight back on. This is that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. Taylor's beating me in the poll so far, and it seems like Scott might be winning with his Irish accent. I didn't really play though, but that's fine. That's fine. I felt that scratchiness in the back of the throat that Scott felt. I thought I, I thought it was quite an interesting. Um, discussion. Let's talk like a pirate. VM um, didn't talk like a pirate, did you, V? No. He did one night. He did one night. So as a, one, you did one line, eh? Can let's hear it. <laughs> okay. Well, it seems like the, it seems like Taylor, the, the second or the first on the poll of the pirates, has found herself another nocturnal bird. So let's go and see what she's got this time. Arrgh, but I wish me had a parrot instead of this owl. I'm not doing that anymore. I'm done now until next year. <laughs> Another owl. And I think it is a spotted eagle owl because I went like this. Watch. Hoo! Hoo! I did it earlier and it turned and looked at me. Now it's ignoring me. I probably said something rude. Let's see. I don't know. What, what, can you see what it is? Is it a spotted eagle owl? I think it's a spotted eagle owl. It doesn't look as big as of a rose eagle owl and then kind of the next best bet is to go with the spotted eagle owl. It's difficult because then when I do this, silhouetted. There it is. Silhouetted. With a spotlight. It's very far away though. It's probably like 70 meters away from us. So not an easy one to see even with the infrared lights on. 
but it is looking around nonetheless. Perhaps there's going to be lots of rodent activity tonight because it is so warm they will be out eating wonderful things. That was nice though, the different species of owls. Pity it's so far away. We always see them out on the roads at night. Sitting on the roads, be very careful when you're driving at night because that bright light hits their eyes and then they can't see like this and then you could crash into a tree. No, you won't, but you might drive, drive over the owl which you don't want, so please be careful. Please look. Okay. What else have we got? We're gonna come up to Treehouse Dam now. Oh, I'll probably drive us there then. Put my foot on the accelerator. That normally makes the car go forward. Oh no, we've actually far out. Are we? Yes, we, no, we're close to Treehouse Dam. Sorry, I had a moment where I couldn't remember if I was on Twin Dams Road or if I was on uh, Weaver's Nest. I'm still actually not too sure, to be honest. Okay, well, we'll check around here. I don't know who we would potentially find at the dam. Shall we magic Hukumuri to Treehouse Dam? Because he's done that to me a few times where I've just said, oh, I think we're going to see him. And then like two seconds later, he's walking down the road towards us. But I don't think that that will happen. I think Hukumuri is far in the west and he's besotted with Tiani and Shidulu by the sounds of it. Or is it the other way around? I don't know what that was. Ran away though. Something small. Also another good area to see Janice. Janet Jackson. Janine, we love you people too. Thank you for saying that you enjoyed the safari and that you love us. That's so sweet. That's very lovely. Thank you so much. I can go to bed a happy girl now. For that comment, for all of you that didn't say it first, better luck next time. Right, okay, so I've discovered that we were on Weaver's Nest and we're now only coming up to, not, we, goodness, we're on Twin Dams, we're now on Elephant Carcass, we're getting to Weaver's Nest, then we will get to Treehouse Dam. Soz. So one day, while I was out in the Mara with Archie, it was really quite funny, I started saying soz because I just got lazy and instead of saying sorry and I say sorry way too often anyway so I think it was me mentally trying to stop saying the word sorry and apologizing for everything and then just went soz and I turned to Archie and I went sozzy I have no idea what sozzy means but that word tickled his fancy and he cackled for about 10 minutes we couldn't do anything he was just laughing so much at sozzy at that word so yeah Sometimes I say, well, most of the time I say bizarre things. I wonder if we'll see the uh, bats at Treehouse Dam again. Maybe, maybe we will. I see lights though. I see another safari vehicle. Why have they got so many lights though? Is it, is it the police? Oh, it's Steve Ovo. Let's do, let's play light, light wars with him. <laughs> Look, we're fighting one another. Who will win? <laughs> Did you hear him? He just went arg from across the train. It's like, do it again, Steve. That no, he's got driving away dramatically to try to blind him one last time. So he's trying to blind me, but ha ha ha, hidden behind the trees. We stopped strategically. He might actually get a better view of the owl. Tell, please tell Steve to keep a lookout on the left-hand side of that drainage line that there was a, I think it was a spotted eagle owl, just sitting up on, on top of a dead tree, but it was closer to that road than I was. Or he is, so he's closer to that road than I am. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna go to Treehouse Dam. The fact that Steve has just swiftly driven over the dam will suggest that there was nothing interesting. Let's see if we can find something. Yeah, okay, we're almost there. I don't know why I'm making karate noises today, sorry. Too much energy. Okay, here we go. Bats. Night jars. Nikki's just said that there's only 10 minutes left to game drive. And then it will be almost sunrise safari, which is my favorite drive. 
I like the sunrise safaris. We have got absolutely nothing except one scrub here. Oh no, I like, and a daker. Here's the daker. I'm going to turn my sport light on and turn all my lights off so the insects don't get me. Was it too far? Oh, what's going on? I I light? Just bang it. No, I'm joking. Don't do it. <laughs> when I can't fix something, I give it a tap. Uh, apologies, everybody. Our infrared light is not working. It's, it's malfunctioning as we speak. So sensor is ref is going on and off, on and off, on and off. Eh, I saw it. Come on. Wait, it's it's working. It's working. Let me show you the day kit. It's still there. It isn't. There it is. It's very far away. You can't see. It's too dark. So we're going to send you to the Mar. Oh no, we're not. You're staying with me. We're not. False alarm. <laughs> the the pa the panic in Nikki's voice. I can't. I cancelled. I cancelled. I cancelled. But we've re-established that we will be sending you to the winner winner of uh, the Pirate Day. Well done, Scott. Um, you will be receiving your award in ten to fourteen working days. Yeah, that tea and all of you are having a good time. Marvellous. Sounds like fun. It's strange what you can get up to on safari when the animals aren't around. And I guess that's part of the joys of being on safari, the quiet moments when we can be a little bit foolish sometimes or just discuss other things or be pirates. Very good. I try to stick some black tape on my teeth. I was trying to get a missing tooth effect. But even the gaffer tape, which is very sticky, will just not stick to my teeth. So that plan failed. I also try to create an eye patch, but that also failed. Very good. Well, the time has come. Steve came in with 12% for the pirate pole. So you got some practice to do, Steve. And then Taylor came in not too far ahead of him with 17%, which leaves me the downright winner with 71%. None of you... No, that wasn't very good. For any of you who voted for those other pirates, you're going to have to walk the plank. <laughs> Blessings. I don't know why when I become a pirate it affects my throat so much. Yeah? I don't know what I'm actually doing, but right in there, but at the back. <clears throat> Not happy. <clears throat> Excuse me. It wasn't a very good impersonation. I think I got lucky with my first one. <laughs> very good. Glad I'm still alive. Just after that. I need some form of lubrication for the throat. Whew. Ah, Peter, I'm very glad you've asked this question because uh, the, the question you're asking is not a normal one. I like abnormal questions which reveal blunders on our behalf as presenters. And you'd like to know if I've ever driven into a tree while looking at the camera. Um, the answer is no to your exact question, but I have driven into a tree whilst trying to see where a lilac-breasted roller was sitting in a marula tree. Some of you were there for that. It wasn't a high-speed collision, but I drove slap-bang into the middle of a very, very big marula tree whilst trying to find a lilac-breasted roller. Um, so yes, mistakes do happen. You can possibly ask Taylor if she has ever fallen on her face live and you can also ask Tristan if he's ever fallen out of a vehicle um, it'll be interesting to hear what they have to say about that I don't think Steve's had any major blunders yet Brent once fell out of a tree I'm told um, 
Very good. Well, you're going to go across to Steve now, so why don't you ask him if he's any, had any live blunders. Um, it's goodbye from myself and James Kaimoe. Thank you for your good camera work. Sorry for rattling you around and some tricky filming this afternoon with Kikenya. It was a chaotic afternoon trying to keep up with her. So if any of you are still busy, I apologize for that. But thank you very much for all of your questions and contributions. It's been great having you on safari. I'm going to say good night and goodbye and send you back to Steve. Thank you, Captain Blackbeard, for your amazing safari this afternoon. Sounds like you had everything, including the pirate win. So I think that's your new name, Scott. Captain Blackbeard, the pirate, with the Irish accent. <laughs> no, I have not fallen out of a car yet. Uh, almost. Um, almost fell out of a car when I landed in an enormous termite mound or aardvark hole in the ground. That has happened to me twice now. Um, both times with Sebastian and both times Sebastian nearly decapitated himself in the back. So I think that is why the, the cam ops need a seat belt at the back, don't you reckon V? VM's fine. He's fine. He's got a, a position he does with his leg that keeps him in, in pole position there. There's a nice sort of metal bar over here. But it, it can get quite bumpy at the back there. And we here, I'm holding on to the wheel. Ride it like at, a horse. Yeah, VM says you've got to ride it like a horse. You've got to go with it in the saddle, eh, VM? Yeah. yeah. You can't let it bounce you because if it bounces you, well, you're in big trouble. You're in big trouble. And I have yet to fall out of a tree either. I've only climbed a couple trees. And, uh, well, I tend to choose ones that aren't going to break when I'm up them. Hashtag James Henry. <laughs> well, what happened with Brent? He fell out of an enormous tortured tree. Um, Herbie was showing me the tree he fell out of. Ooh, there's a daker in the road. Brent fell out of an enormous tortured tree and he just missed a very sharp branch or stump on the ground. That's all fun and games that he survived, but that could have been pretty bad for Brent, that is, not for the stump. There's the delicate movements of the Daker. The female Daker. We are on the road called Ingwe Alley, which is Leopard Alley. This is a road that we very famously find all sorts of cats on, namely Hosanna, Tingana and Tandi. So that's what we're going for. We're going for a last minute leopard. It would be wonderful if we could find one. Wonderful if we could find the Duke himself. Wouldn't that be marvelous? Yes, it would be. On we go. Lights on. Dacre's moved out of the way. Dacre have got that very particular sort of size and the, the distance of the eyes together that um, make them look very similar to a leopard. Um, very, very similar, very easy to confuse distance if you're looking in the long grass. You can think it's a, think it's a leopard, just that sort of size and shape. But when you do get this, the body and you see the actual body, well, it's, it's very difficult to, to get them confused, should I say. Even from the drone, we spent a lot of time, spent a lot of time getting confused with dakers in the beginning. Eventually, we got quite good at spotting leopards from the air. But anyway, from Wildebeest and myself, it has been a really interesting and awesome afternoon from our side with regards to the wild dogs and all that activity. And uh, we're going to have a beautiful evening. We're going to be ripping off Scott for the next month or so with his, his uh, Irish um, pirate accent. And let's go for the final end of the show to Taylor. Good night. Senzo's very ups upset with you now, Steve, because he says you were eating in our time to close the show. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he also did it in a really weird voice. Also, I'm just joking, guys. We don't get upset with one another. Uh, I did ask Nikki if we could extend the show, though, because I've got some great jokes. I don't. I've got none. Right, we're... Ooh, Mousy! Did you see that, Senzo? Look, 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 look! It's so small! Okay, infrared is off. Hello, little one. Look how small and tiny it is. Of course I found a little mouse. It is now frozen in the grass. Don't worry, we don't have any lights on it or anything. That thing is like the length, with its tail, the length of my index finger. That is how small this little creature is. It hopped on the road. I thought it was a frog initially, 
but it is not a frog. Little Mousy, can you turn around please so we can see what you are? I haven't got a clue what species this is. I know it's one of the striped mouse. Perhaps it's a little pouched mouse or a field mouse. There you go. I just realized that we don't want to eat it. And I don't think it will stay out for very long. Oh, sorry. It kind of does resemble a little pouched mouse. Off you go. Run, run. Be safe. Don't get eaten. Precious little darling. Well, of course I would say something like that about a mouse. But that was really cute. Right, we've only got 20 seconds left. Do you think I can recite the alphabet? No, I probably won't because I don't know all the letters. Anyways, it's been a fantastic day, as Steve has said. And you can look forward to it again tomorrow morning on the Sunrise Safari. So join us then and keep an eye out on the dab cam. Toodaloo, bye-bye. See you later.